Good evening and welcome to the Eastern School Committee meeting of Thursday, February 13, 2020. The first item up is minutes, regular minutes from January 9, 2020. Any comments or corrections? Don't vote on this because we weren't here, right? Okay. You can still vote. Okay. You can still vote too. Okay. Yeah, no, I had no comments. I saw that trust. Yeah. Everybody Do I vote? Everybody went good. <laughs> so moved. Second. All those in favor? Thank you. And our second minutes are from January 24th, 2020. Any comments or corrections, please? organization facilities use. Mm -hmm. Mrs. O'Neill suggested having a cap on the number of hours. Um, it's actually a cap on the number of hours for the established fee and then with the option to charge more for additional hours, right? I mean, that was what I suggested in terms of the fees. Yes, yes. <laughs> so it's not just a cap, you know, it's not just an outright cap. It's just a cap on the number of hours for the established fee and then with the option of charging for additional hours. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, do I have a motion to accept these minutes? So moved. Second, do I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Thank you. With the change. <laughs> with, with the change. <laughs> yes. Scheduled payments is going around the table. Next, we have the presentation and possible vote to accept Alvarez's Ames' program of study for 2020-2021 with a presentation by Matt Auger regarding social studies change. Dr. Cabral. Okay, so these two presentations will go together annually. The high school works with all of the department chairs, the building leadership, and um, the assistant superintendent to come up with a new program of studies catalog for you. There may be some minor changes here and there. Mr. Paul are going to, is going to explain to you. Sometimes we have some very exciting changes, so he'll highlight the major differences. In addition to that, the chair of the <coughs> History Social Studies Department, Matt Auger, is also going to do a special presentation because we have recently, or in 2018, adopted new um, frameworks for the course content. And it is going to require some shuffling of course sequence. And so he'll explain that to you after Mr. Yeah, I'll make a presentation. No, I'll start. Matt's going to follow. He has a, a video presentation. So we want to stay here? Right there. Okay. Thank I think you. I have most of the documentation in front of Okay. Me. Thank you. Um, by way of explanation, there are um, a couple of things I wanted to highlight for not only you, but for the audience at home, and that is the work that we've been doing in guidance <coughs> and uh, administration looking at the college and career connections component to our program of studies and trying to take a look at the fast-paced world that our students are growing up in, the, the work world, and trying to find ways to connect what they're studying, what their interests are, what the clubs are that we have in our school, and link them to some of the clusters of careers that exist in our world. We use the clusters, there are 16 of them, that we use in Naviance, which is our software management package for our students. Those 16 career clusters, and they're for the audience because they don't have it in front of them, are Agricultural, food and natural resources, architecture and, architecture and construction, arts, audiovisual technology and communication, business administration and management, education and training, finance, government and public administration, health science, hospitality and tourism, human services, information technology, law, public safety, corrections and security, manufacturing, marketing, science, technology, engineering and mathematics, transportation, distribution and logistics. Those pretty much cover just about every career possibility that, that exists currently. And, and what this booklet that we have, um, 
that is available on our website, both as a standalone document and also is included in the program of studies for the families, is an ability for the students to look at those clusters in the center and then begin to take a look at the things that are offered at all of Rams High School. Courses that would directly tie if you had an interest in some of those careers, the, the careers that would fall within each of those clusters. The college majors that students, if they're interested in that, would, should consider pursuing. And if I didn't say this, the clubs and activities that we have that they may have an interest in. So it's really trying to get the students and the families to start thinking about, you know, Wes, what are you interested in? And start to find that diagram that might help them take a look at different electives. Now these courses that are listed as connected to it are above and beyond the standards that we have in math, science, history, and they're just, these are the, the, some of the courses that you would take above and beyond in some of those areas and in other elective fields as well. Mm -hmm. So we really feel as though that was the major piece of our work this past year in working on refining this, this concept of connecting what we do to some of the career pathways that exist. And um, I'm very proud of the work that the, the team did. I also want to give credit to Sue Mancus, uh, excuse me, Sue Sweeney and um, Kristen Shea who worked with me and my limited art experience and marketing experience and were able to put together the um, Adobe workshop that uh, produced this document for you. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a separate, it's different than Google Docs, uh, who's a, we were able to merge the two for our program studies and for the families. So we're excited about that. We've already sent a letter home talking about this to families. We've had a number of people call the guidance office asking, you know, where they can be because the program studies hasn't been approved yet. Um, so we did put the, the, the standalone booklet on the website for parents to begin the process to We've got some good feedback on that. With regard to the changes in the program of studies, Matt has a lot more to, to discuss with history. I just want to let you know about a couple of changes. The first is um, show choir has been dropped. And I actually have, Chris, I'm going to do this as well. This is a summary sheet of the changes. Um, we're dropping the core show choir. This came about last year in meeting with Rob Wheeler and looking at the program of studies and taking a look with, at our ensemble groups and the fact that show choir students um, had a course, but we didn't have a course for chamber orchestra, we didn't have a course for the jazz band, and we felt as though from an equity perspective that while we were going through the process of making things streamlined, that was a course that our students could still participate in show choir after school, still take course choir during the course of the day, but didn't have that extra course, which was our hope someday if we, we build our program up that some of our, all of our ensembles would have such a course, but that was the reason that you see that drop there. So we didn't have a confusion when it came time to sign up for courses. The ads for this coming year are an additional health course, uh, excuse me, wellness course in advanced mindfulness and fitness. That's an elective for our juniors and seniors, which ties directly to the strategic plan that we're looking at all of the impacts that our students have in stressing out and trying to find ways to support them socially and emotionally. So this course deals with meditation, yoga, um, and different types of stress releases that they can incorporate into their daily lives. And if you look at some of the research I've been reading about what Fortune 500 countries companies are looking for, they're looking for students who possess some of these skills mm -hmm. to be able to self-regulate. So I think it's a, it's a good course for us all. And then the child development course we talked about last year, this is our long-term, this is the initial step in our long-term plan for the district. Um, but this course makes a lot of sense for a number of reasons. Our students um, used to have an option for taking this course at Oliver Ames High School. Um, but I don't think we define it as clearly as we have today and with our career clusters. I think a lot of students would benefit from taking this child development course. If you're thinking about medicine, if you're thinking about nursing, if you're thinking about anything that deals with children, teaching, child care, coaching, this child development course will really be able to, from guidance and from administration, tell the students it's an important piece of an electorate that they could, they could take. The other piece is long term, we're looking to try to find a way to incorporate a child care program within a district. And this course would be a course that would lead to the next section of their development, which would be an internship where they would actually work in the daycare if they had taken this course and met some of the requirements that we have. So this is the initial step. And we felt as though even though we don't have an idea exactly as to when and where the child care program will be, this course should be offered. If, if students sign up for it and there's enough, we will, we will run it. And uh, we're looking forward to that. So those are the changes directly to the program of studies. Everything else was uh, pretty much, we, we did a lot of changes in the last few years and we're still 
sorting that out and, and working with it so there wasn't a great appetite for adding anything addition this year. Um, we do continue to take a look at what students are asking for and what their potential interests are and if we get something that is overwhelming with you know an interest that's something we need to look at. Thank you. Does, there are, I'm sorry. does anyone have any questions? I, uh, I do. Go, Go ahead. ahead. So um, on show choir, so I noticed this is on page 58. So what there, page 58. 58. So I noticed that there are some of the extracurricular music activities listed. Those are listed just to show what, what exists within the department. Okay. So I see but you have courses. Right, but I see you've marching band, jazz ensemble, show choir, pit band, but not show choir, musical theater. Is there a reason that these were selected for inclusion, but some of the other extracurriculars that the music department offers are not included? That's a really good question. I would have to I'd have to get back to you on that. Okay. Um, I don't have an, I don't have a, a, a solid answer for okay. at this moment. That's kind of I hate to say it, but that's been like that for so long. Okay. That it may be a situation where the music department and I have just overlooked it. Okay. Um, but certainly there's no there's no reason for not listing all the ensembles. Okay. Least. All right. Yeah. So look like yeah. So it, and it, it's still time. I mean, this is the approval process. So. Yeah. Um, it isn't published yet. If that's something that you want to make an amendment to, I can make sure that we, we put that in. Yeah, I think it would make sense to Absolutely. just review with the music department and yeah. see if there's, you know, any other, you know, see chamber orchestra, show choir, pit band, jazz ensemble, marching band, and in reference to private music instruction. So sure. maybe some of the others yeah. should be included. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. That's another question. I have a show choir question. Sure. Um, is, is Mr. Wheeler okay with that elimination? Um, I, I think in the process of the conversation about equity, I don't think anybody's okay with a reduction in their department of anything, but I think in a conversation about the equity, <coughs> the ensemble groups, that that was something that we, we agreed that if we truly don't have a chamber orchestra force and we don't have a chamber <coughs> force for those vibrant groups, and we, we have a vibrant show fire, but we also have that course, and the students can still participate like they do in chamber and they do in jazz band, they can still participate in, in show choir. At this point in time, it made sense to not have it in the program studies and make it confusing and keep it equitable. That was the conversation we had last year. But to say he was approval, he, he was happy with the idea, um, I don't think he was thrilled that we were reducing the, that, but I think he understood. So that's the fairest all answer I can give. Yeah, I just have a couple. There are some um, courses in here that say dependent on budget increase for personnel and materials. Are those still kind of pending, or those were put in place a number of years ago okay. as options if students signed up for it, and then we would. This would be a two-year process. So what would happen is if that course that has that listing had a subscription that was substantial enough that I went to Dr. Cabral and said, you know, we had 22 kids sign up for this okay. course. We didn't put it in the budget for this year because we didn't have the numbers last year. Okay. But if next year I have 22 students who signed up for a course that said depending on budget, yeah. it would need to go through the budget process and it would need to be funded. Okay. And the other question I just wanted to ask is I know we're, and you and the other principals have been, we're all limited with our budget constraints, but if you could add any, say, math or science or computer courses, are there certain ones that you kind of have? on tap that if you get funding that you would want to add in the future? We, we have talked about in science looking at a engineering course. Okay. Um, we have talked about in math um, some additional electives. Uh -huh. um, nothing really in addition to electives, but at this point any elective that we were adding would probably be in computer science yep. um, and some level of programming and okay. really at the the beginning stages of that okay. in the last two years. So okay. and we're doing well. We have an AP course that's doing well in that area. Oh, good. Okay. Um, so I think we're, we're in good shape. We, we will potentially get to that point where there's going to be a need for juniors and seniors to have another elective in computer science. Okay. That's an option. Right. Thank you. <coughs> Dr. Cabral? That's not a question, just a couple of comments. I know that the group doesn't necessarily have the visual and there's no way you can read it but I'm super proud of the work that all of them have done on this and I think it's very important to 
really, not that your explanation wasn't clear, but just to sort of get an idea of the visual, I would encourage you to take a look at this online. Uh, so this is an example of uh, business administration and management is the core area. And then the four pillars around it explain all of our AIMS courses that are related to the field, related college majors, clubs and organizations, and career opportunities. You can imagine how helpful that is to a student who's trying to navigate their interests. To just look at a list of, in our guidance department is wonderful at providing this guidance, but to have this level of detail for what we already provide, we already have so many wonderful and robust programs here, including our extracurriculars and our clubs, that to have them thoughtfully sit down and process it in a way that they can <coughs> help students encourage them to pursue the fields and areas that are of most interest to them and help them really connect that to a way that they can advance their study and enter a career field that is in line with their interests and what they love to do. So a, ch a student can approach this from any one of the areas. They can flip through all the clubs and activities first and see which things really engage them and they find of interest and in what's, what's connected as courses that are similar or related to them. <coughs> This is just such a, a, a very helpful document. It's not necessarily adding courses or adding because we already have so many things that are wonderful here that this was a tremendous amount of work to put this together, taking into account everything that we offer our students and package it in a way that helps them understand what they want to do for the future. So I really want to make sure, you know, you very humbly explained it, but I want to make sure that everyone understands just how much work went into this. Um, in terms of the programs of, program of studies, um, I understand you, you had explained the equity issue before. I understand it. Of course, nobody wants to lose courses in any area, but it makes sense. In terms of adding, well, they also make sense. Advanced mindful fitness. How many times have we talked about the social-emotional needs of students? And we're in completely reactive mode in helping kids once they've had experienced difficulties. This is a very important step in making progress in providing proactive assistance to students. Ways to help them manage stress, anxiety, um, things that can help them in their courses, uh, strategies, mindfulness, yoga, meditation, things that they can take with them honestly throughout their lives. So that's a wonderful addition. Uh, and the child development. I mean, really thinking outside of the box here. When we're looking at career opportunities for students, to give them that opportunity, whether they're going to be, as Mr. Paul said, in the medical field, a teacher, a parent, really. It, it's their wonderful skills for our students to learn and to have the opportunity to apply that in a daycare, which has the added, added benefit of, um, of assisting our staff who, are, who have young children and can potentially be in the district. These are, I mean, this is a lot of extra work that people are, are, are really engaged in in trying to make things better for our students. So we have this wonderful set of offerings, and this is a way of, in your question, Jackie, was great, you know, how can we augment what we already have? And it's heartbreaking to hear that because I've heard the conversations, and there are so many things, but even the things that Mr. Paul mentioned are really reactive. Uh, and I know that the, the team has the capacity and has discussed what we could do in a real, very visionary way. But bringing in computer science, our media courses, we don't offer many of them because we have to turn students away. That's an area that's highly um, sought after that we just don't, but that's a 21st century skill mm -hmm. with uh, technology. So, you know, even the engin engineering, in the, in, the, in the age of STEAM and STEM, and we don't have engineering courses for our students, um, you know, more math electives. These are things we really should be providing our kids. These are able to be provided cost neutral. And so I just think it's important that when people are looking at these, it's not for a lack of imagination or, or our staff knowing what it is our students need. This is what we're able to provide in a cost neutral way. So child care for child development, for example, is in family and consumer science. So we offer the cut course that we have in that area and we offer this instead. And that's a way to <coughs> make it cost neutral or, or we've combined some departments in some cases, which is what allows us to make it cost neutral. So I just want to, again, commend the staff for um, continuing to think of ways in this very limited budget situation that we find ourselves in, 
continue to find ways to engage our kids and provide them advanced programming, <coughs> even though they may not have access to some of the things that we really know we need to provide our students going forward. So really great job. The guidance department, the department chairs, assistant superintendent, Mr. Paul, building leaders, a, a very, very good job on this. Thank you. Yeah, this is, this is great. Nancy, if I could just say in a few short words what we just said, this is a massive <coughs> I really was blown away by it. I was actually um, also noticing that you have so much crossover mm -hmm. among the various areas, but it makes perfect sense. I mean, to add Spanish to every, you know, construction and to every other, you know, things. I really love the thought that went into this. Mm -hmm. A lot of deep thinking there. I've also been fortunate um, to be in the meetings when this was being discussed with the department heads, and I just really want to commend Wes on his vision for this and his persistence with um, with getting this done and really making sure that it was very meaningful for every student at All Brains. So, thank you. I have to say, this was, I know we've been talking about this for several months, this is much more robust than I had imagined, and I have two kids who will be going through course selection for next year and it's extremely helpful so thank you to everybody who worked on this it's awesome thank you do you want us to vote on this program of studies and then have matt present or do you want matt to present and then vote you can do that. you can vote first okay are there any other comments or questions about mr paul's presentation okay do i have a motion so do we want to accept this is or do we want to say it again do we want to accept it as is or do we want to wait for some feedback uh, on the um, co-curriculars okay. music. Could you accept it with the, the amendments to... That you're going to add them. Add yeah. Them yeah. yeah. Work with Mr. Wheeler. Is that okay with I'd you? I'd be comfortable doing so that. So you made that motion? Okay. I made that <laughs> motion. <laughs> Second. Second. Okay. All those in favor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Matt, you. do you want us to go up? What? Oh, I'm sorry. Four to one. Sorry. Got that? Thank you. Do you want us to, you're making a presentation? Yeah. So we'll go up here? Sure. Social Studies Department Chair here at Albury High School. I'm here to talk about the new state frameworks for social studies and history. Um, so back in June of 2018, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education approved new K-12 history and social studies standards. And the emphasis when they were writing these new standards, was preparing young people to engage in civic life in a democracy. And one of the big cornerstones of this new change was a statewide eighth grade civics course. So across the Commonwealth, students in eighth grade are now taking a full year of civics. So for us in Easton, what does that mean? Well, it changes a couple of things, and I'm going to hit on that in a moment because we don't currently offer a full year of civics in the eighth grade. Um, they also, when they wrote these, created standards of practice pre-K to 12, um, seven of them. So when students are taking our social studies courses at the middle and high school, when they're in social studies, when they're doing social studies from kindergarten all the way up, they're learning about how to demonstrate civic knowledge, skills, and dispositions. The goal here is for students to develop uh, questions and problem statements and conduct inquiries, organize information and data from multiple primary and secondary sources, 
analyze the purpose and point of view of each source, distinguishing fact from opinion, evaluating the credibility, accuracy, and relevancy of each source, arguing explaining conclusions, <coughs> using reasoning and evidence, and determining next steps to take informed action as appropriate. One of the other things that's happened, one of the other things that happened in addition to the new frameworks is the Massachusetts State Legislature passed a bill in which all students in grade eight and then again in high school are participating in an action civics project. So that's in addition to the changes to the frameworks. And you're gonna have an opportunity to see what that might look like when some of our seniors present about their action civics project in a few moments. So what does this mean for us here in Easton? Well, in order to accommodate this new change at the eighth grade level, we have to add an eighth grade civics course. Um, as you may or may not know, currently in eighth grade, we do world history. We do from the fall of the Roman Empire through the Enlightenment. So it's a big shift for us here to move that eighth grade course. Um, in addition, we have always separated early man to the fall of Rome and geography as two separate courses. So as you see here, um, currently we're in the 1920 school year, so we've done ancient Civ in grade six, which is you know early man to fall of Rome, and then in grade seven, do geography, world geography. Those two courses have been kind of combined as a hybrid by the state into a world geography and cultures in which they've broken it up into seven regions. And so grade six and seven will be a two-year course hitting on all of those seven regions. And then grade eight will be a full year of civics. So if they spend all of grade eight learning about civics, about Massachusetts Constitution, US Constitution, and their role in America and democracy, it made sense to, in grade nine, to then go to US history, rather than jump to world history and then back to US. And so in order to roll this out, what you'll see here is at the high school, there's no changes for next year. Um, next year, there'll be changes to middle school, big changes for them, and a new civics course in the eighth grade. The following year, when those eighth graders then come up to the high school, that's when you'll start to see a shift at the high school level, in which in that following year, the students will have U.S. history in, in ninth grade, U.S. history two in tenth grade, and then our world history course will be moved to eleventh grade. Um, and all the electives will still be there. We'll see what happens in the future, maybe we have an opportunity to have more electives in the future as this rolls out. But in terms of our core courses, those are the big changes. So, I don't know if anyone has any questions, but yes. Yeah. What is your genuine reaction about the changes that the state is requiring or recommending? Um, I'm just wondering. Well, I'm excited that, you know, we got new standards. You know, it had been since 2002, was the last time the standards were written. Um, me, you know, I, and I think all educators and, you know, a lot of us feel like civics is important. And the fact that they're requiring civics across eighth grade, across the Commonwealth, I think is a healthy thing for our schools and our democracy, uh, for students to understand where, what their role is as a citizen. Um, one of the components of that eighth grade civics course is media literacy and evaluating sources, evaluating opinion from fact and looking at not just taking something as is at face value but questioning things and looking for um, verification, looking at what is reliable and what's not reliable in terms of sourcing. Um, so they learn about Massachusetts government, they learn about their local town government, they'll learn, learn about the federal government. Um, and where they fit in the big picture. So I think that's a good thing. I think that's great. Now, there's been so much um, discussion about the importance of civics and how it's been missing for so literally for decades, whereas right. it was an important part of the years ago. <clears throat> but there must be some loss, too, unfortunately. It's not like we can just add. We have to do what you're doing with just this combining and, and you have to come up with these um, kind of extreme measures to accommodate this new requirement, but I do think it's critically important to have civic data. Yeah. Well, and I'm so glad you're doing the media literacy part. I think that's absolutely essential. Yeah. And I think it's important to point out that some of those, that the, the media literacy components are not just in that eighth grade course. Right. They appear throughout. 
where students are going to be asked to look at secondary and primary sources and really evaluate who is this author, what is their purpose, um, can I corroborate this information by looking at additional sources. So that, that appears throughout the curriculum. Um, and you're right, uh, it is a challenge when you add a new course into our program of studies with the civics course, so it does squeeze out some other things and we have to make some tough choices, but as history teachers we know that every year we add another year of history. So it's, we're always being asked to do more with less time, and so. I feel like we've got three years. Yes, yeah, it's fine. So, I'm pretty sure I know the answer, but when you say intermediate war course, so from US history one, US history two, I assume that means it's not just the court, it's honors history one, it's AP, yeah. it's, it's the courses that we go with that core topic. Right. Yeah, and, and the way the state wrote the frameworks, and we're going to look at that as we develop our own Easton UBD, um, the split for U.S. history has traditionally been around Reconstruction, and they've shifted that um, that to World War One, and so there is there's a shift there in the hopes that more of the contemporary history has a chance to get some significant coverage. So. And just I mean, I love the fact that the world geography and cultures is now, it just seems intuitive that you would combine those concepts together. But that's what you want to learn about cultures and societies and where they live and how that affects them. It just seems like a natural. Yeah, absolutely. That world geography and cultures, grade six and seven, will be a look at the geography of that region. Then it'll look at the history of that region. And they'll try to make connections and bring that forward to today. I also want to add that um, the, the new frameworks are actually incorporating a lot of literacy standards. Um, there's a big push for our language and literacy development within the frameworks, the social science and history frameworks as well. Um, there's a big research component as far as well as um, thinking um, abstractly and making logical arguments, and also around presentations. There's 10 guiding principles that are really interesting to look at to see how they came up with the frameworks um, that, you know, in your spare time, if you feel want to have a nice read, um, it, it's actually very interesting. Oh, I'm, a, I'm a geek like that, I guess. Um, but I, I think that, um, you know, Matt has done a phenomenal job. He came to me before they, just as they were published and said, Chrissy, we need to change everything, but we, here's the trajectory, and his forward thinking has really benefited our, our kids. Um, and I was going to share in my update that we are also um, looking at new programs, a new program for our sixth and seventh grade classrooms to support them um, around the new frameworks. So that is also coming, as well as the development of the civics units, which our eighth grade teachers are working on. And Matt has really been instrumental in, in providing that guidance, reaching out to publishers, and all the work that is incorporated in that. Um, and we also will be looking at a K to five um, in a few year, in a year or so. So starting that journey as well. So thank you. Um, so I also want to add sort of an answer to Caroline's question. So now, if you look at it from a district perspective, if you're pulling out of history and social, can you actually go to the beginning, Matt? I'm sorry, the, the yeah. standards in the beginning. <coughs> yeah, standards about? for practice. Oh, yes. Sorry. That's okay. So he did go through this, but I just want to draw your attention to this because we do agree that this is a vast improvement, and we're very ha pleased with the way that the state is bringing things together across content areas, considering conceptual understandings as well as content. Um, and so <coughs> this is a perfect example. If you look at things like this, you know, look at the second one. Develop focused questions or problem statements and conduct inquiries. How many, you can do that in science, you do that in math, you do that in English class. So these, the standards for mathematical practice are very simple, similar. Um, things like um, persevere in solving problems, choose the correct tool, um, pay attention to detail. And so these are things that we're now taking all these standards of practice and our leadership team, the curriculum leadership team, has put together the transfer skills and things that we're using across 
the district from pre-K to 12. So now we're leveraging what students are learning, not only from grade to grade, but also across content areas. And so this is giving people uh, the tools to do that. So that now we can start sharing horizontal. Once, once our units are in place, we can start sharing horizontally. And everyone's got a piece of media literacy. And everyone's got a piece of attending to problems with detail. And everyone's got a piece. And these are all the skills they can take with them regardless of the content either the content area or even the piece of content, the factual information that they might be learning. And so yes, I share your, your pain in the English department, every year was more books, now forget about it, right? Um, so it, it, it got to a point with the internet particularly that facts and details can be found very easily. And while content will always be important, uh, giving kids the conceptual underpinnings of making the connections, like Jane said, between geography and cultures and movement and, and, and natural resources and, and how that plays into things like conflicts and that is now the direction that, um, and our teachers have been, Matt's been doing a phenomenal job with them as has our curriculum leader at the middle school, Gary Erickson. So we are very pleased to see that they were organized this way and it's very similar to the ELA math standards that have already been out and the science standards as well. So. Bigger answer to your question, I guess, than just do we like the standards, but it's good to know that they are all fitting together. And there's an, I don't know if you have the slide here, how it fits in perfectly with the UBD work in terms of identifying. Okay, so, so the. Yeah, the way the frameworks are written, um, each grade level has a, a set of topics, which, I mean, we could essentially adopt as our units. Each topic has supporting questions, which could then become our essential questions. Um, and each topic specifically states all the things a student should know and be able to do, which is written very UBD friendly for us. So I mean, in terms of adoption, there's obviously some, some work that needs to happen in order to make this truly seamless. But you know, some of the work was done at the state level because I think a lot of districts are already doing UBD, so they want to cater to that. But the, you know, the, these teams in all the content areas have been working so hard on this, even the, even the paradigm shift of thinking about things from an understanding by design um, pedagogy. And so they've really mastered that understanding and what are essential questions. And so, you know, for them to, it, it's, I guess I'm prideful to say, to even make those connections that quickly and say, well, these are essential questions. These are our topics. It's, it's so, it makes so much sense. Again, you're humbly saying that, but that shows your command of everything that we've been working on, and that's that's really <coughs> great. And you know, I want to make sure you extend that to the team and all the teams, so that they realize all the work that they've been doing has really given them, even heightened their competency in these areas. And and now they've got this is very validating for all the work that you've all been doing. I hope you feel that way. So that's good. That's great. I'm really I'm really happy with this work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For the class, I would do a classroom presentation. Yes, yes. Okay. okay. So, <coughs> thank you, Matt. <coughs> the next item on the agenda is to a uh, possible vote to approve outdoor classrooms presented by OA Social Studies teacher and law class. Dr. <coughs> Okay, so we have a team setting up here. We're just gonna give them a second to get situated. I'll have them introduce themselves. So again, what we love to see and encourage is some students who are thinking outside the box, who are um, challenging norms, looking at ways they can solve problems in our community and create more opportunities for themselves and for others uh, in the school system, and some risk taking. So they, they came forward to central office and wanted to make this proposal. Um, Assistant Superintendent Pruitt met with them, and I'll have her do a, a quick introduction because I don't want to take away from the presentation at all, but I just wanted to express, again, our pride in this class and their teacher taking the initiative to approach us with a real world situation that they can come up with a creative solution for. 
So Brian Gottsall had reached out to me um, asking to have me attend his class to so his students could share an idea that they had. After hearing their presentation, we um, I want to share that I totally support their initiative, um, and I ask that they come to the school committee for their approval as well. Um, so I just want to turn over to Ryan and all the efforts that he's done. So uh, before I let them get into their presentation, just uh, alluding to what Matt Auger said. So this, uh, these are students from my semester one long legal class. And Matt talked about uh, action civics becoming um, a priority, especially in the social studies standards. So for the past three years, my classes have worked on an action civics curriculum. And so uh, these students use that action civics curriculum to develop this project. Um, so I'll let them introduce themselves and give the show and let them uh, take over. <laughs> My name is Jackson Keller. Um, I'm a senior as is uh, in uh, Mr. Gossel's law and legal class. Hello, I'm Lydia Euler. I'm also a senior and I was also in the semester one class. So basically what we found was that student mental health has been an increasing issue in our school and um, as a way to improve that we found that student mental health in the classroom has been the primary issue. So we're in classrooms all day in seats my back hurts. <laughs> we like to be outside and be more engaged with our, t with our classroom. So we found that being inside found gives you higher anxiety levels and we did some research on it and actually read studies by doctors that prove that the more time you spend outside the better you'll actually feel. So we feel that the best way to implement education and being outside at the same time would be an outdoor classroom. So we found that across from our library we have a completely underutilized courtyard that's never open. It's usually actually locked. And we feel that we can actually transform that into a new learning environment where we could have almost like you could sign it out to um, yeah. different teachers to teaching classrooms on like a straight that's <coughs> nice outside. So um, we mainly reached this idea whenever our class was divided if we wanted to deal with mental health or environmental issues. So some of the like things that we were talking about were like issues with littering and then like also like oh with some of the students that we now have are having increasing levels of depression and anxiety and they feel trapped. So we came together and we wanted to improve mental health through nature and we looked at studies and whenever um, schools implemented outdoor classrooms they saw less referrals and grades increase as well. And as a senior, I can also just say for myself that the more time you spend in this routine, it, you start to become less motivated and excited. And I feel like if you were to have an outdoor classroom, this is just breaking that harsh routine that you're always in and that you're showing up here every day and you sit in this room and you're going to learn something. Like this will really broaden our horizons and our unique learning skills and like what we can do to improve student mental health and our emotional capacity and what we can do as a community, also as a school. So we also found that not only uh, students are interested in this outdoor classroom, we actually polled teachers all throughout the school, and we found that they were actually 25 out of the 26 that we did poll were absolutely for this idea. They feel that they would love to teach an outdoor classroom, and the only teacher that felt that they couldn't do that was a chemistry teacher that felt that she couldn't implement chemistry being outside <laughs> because <laughs> safety. So but every other teacher found that it was a great idea. They feel that they would love to teach in an outdoor environment. They feel that they could keep students away. We also felt that we could take away from cell phones. We feel that technology-free environment, being outdoors, will keep students engaged, more focused, and better receptive towards information. And uh, we also uh, ask students as well, so we have an uh, Instagram page where the senior class follows us, and so we made a poll with like, would you like the idea of an outdoor classroom? And out of 100 students, 80 um, students re responded positively to the idea of having an outdoor classroom, and they were okay with no phones since they want to be present whenever they are going to be learning outside. And um, the way we wanted to implement this was we wanted this to be completely budget free initially, and we wanted to use recycled materials from the school that we have here. So we could use benches, clipboards, whiteboards, and whatever we can find to make the courtyard more of a classroom setting. And we also, I'm part of the art department, and I'm also co-president of the art club, and we wanted to implement a mural outside just to beautify the courtyard and also get a community together. And we would have like a contest for a mural that kids could sign up for and um, kind of put down their ideas of what they would want in their outdoor classroom. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's that it.
Yeah. That's a great idea. Um, what is in the courtyard now, physically, what's in the courtyard? Um, as of right now, nothing. We, kinda, we have a few benches that are sitting outside, and we also have like um, a concrete like um, surface that we can put benches on and move tables onto. Um, we also have, um, we have like plants and nature and stuff out there, but we wanted to <coughs> encourage maybe like biology classes or just like students for fun if they wanted to like plant their own gardens there or like even the students could do it as volunteer work so we could like kind of improve the landscape just in general. We also talked about sustainability, right? Mm -hmm. So what will happen when you guys are gone? Uh, and do you want to talk about, about that when you... Well, we were going to have the like um, succeeding lawn legal classes to take care of the um, courtyard whenever we were there. And um, also we wanted to have like umbrellas there to like just so whenever we were there in the summer so like kids wouldn't get like um, sunburn or anything. And we were going to try any way to keep like the environment as like safe as possible. And um, yeah, so we were gonna make it like an obligation for students to keep this intact. And of course we would have to speak with custodians if they wanted to help keep this intact. But as of right now, it would be like a student obligation. Any other questions? Yes. So what are what do you consider your next steps? So we've been going through this brew process. So by starting through with Mr. Gotzel and creating this project, we began to bring it up as far as we can go. So we started with Mr. Paul. We did an in-class presentation showing him our idea. And once he was decided that he was for it, that's when we invited Ms. Pruitt to come do another presentation for her. And now we're trying to bring it to you to see if we can try to get it implemented. So we've been going through a step-by-step -step process, trying to get approval along the way to implement it. Endorse. So if you get approval this evening, are you going to create a sketch up, a mock up, or are you, how, what are your design steps, I guess, and determining what you need to get for resources, or? So we have been talking to Mr. Paul about what we can actually use for recycled materials. So we saw that in the basement there are a lot of underutilized um, <laughs> stuff down there so that we can try to revitalize. Since the class of 2019, their gift was actually, like their class gift was picnic tables. So the picnic tables that were already out there are now underutilized, which means that Mr. Paul has said that it would be okay for us to take a few of them and move them out here so it would be a cost neutral okay. um, project. Perhaps each class each year could add a component to it. Yeah. Absolutely. Challenge your junior. We definitely like encourage like community like incorporation into the outdoor classroom. Like if any student has an idea of how to make it better, or if they want to change, like we want them to like come to us and like see what we can do about it. Like it's definitely going to be very changeable and like adaptable to students' needs. I also want to commend them for their the, their youthful um, uh, purpose in well not youthful it's it's their their recognition of the the need for a technology free environment and I think that that is really important for their peers to see that this is coming from them and not from the adults. Um, because they're, they're recognizing that that is something that is just a really important to be present when they're out there. And how to be present, and part of that is to be without a device. So, nice job. Okay. Do I have a motion to accept the outdoor classroom for the law class and uh, Mr. Gotzel? So well, move under under Mr. Under Paul's Mr. Paul's guidance. Oversight. <laughs> Oversight. <laughs> so moved. Second. All those in favor. Thank you. Thank you.
What a nice winter. <coughs> no snow. Oh. Oh. Get the grains cracking up in March. So I need to make a motion to change the order. Okay, I'm going to make a motion that we bring item number nine up right now because we're going to be starting our presentations for the school meeting at 7.30. So um, we uh, make a motion to bring number nine up. Second. All those in favor. Okay. Uh, this is personnel retirements. Dr. Cabral. Thank you. So... I'm not sure if you have them in the same order that I do, so. We have five retirements this evening. It is the season. Um, we have some, a lot of experience going out the door at the end of the year and even sooner. So I'd like to go through the five of them. The first is Jane Demling. Jane has been with the district for 15 years. She's worked for the Eastern Public Schools in food, food service at Richardson Olmsted. She retired <coughs> on January 31st. She retired shortly after her notice. So she has already retired, and I certainly congratulate her <laughs> on that. I think you have a letter from her? Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to do I read? Yes. Okay. I am writing to inform you that January 31st, 2020 will be my last day as I will be retiring. I really enjoyed working for Richardson Olmstead and all of my co workers. My husband and I have some health issues and we have to take care of, therefore, I think feel it's time to retire. Thank you again for the opportunity of working for this company. Is, is Jane here? There's a lot of people here. Okay. I invite them to come because I think it's very important for them to be recognized, even though we celebrate them. So congratulations to Jane. Second is Cheryl Corkum. She's been with the district for 34 years. She has also worked in the um, food service department, but at Moreau Hall. She plans to retire on April 24th, so she won't be finishing the school year, but she's not quite finished yet. So congratulations to Cheryl. Um, I work for food service at Morrow Hall. I'm going to retire. My retirement date is April 24th. That was her letter. That's, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and so now we have um, three more long-term. This is getting more and more difficult as we go along here. Uh, Karen Lund has been with Easton for 34 years. She began her time in Easton as a pre-K teacher in the Project Early Preschool Classroom, which is now the Easton Public Schools Preschool, at Center School in 1995. She earned professional teaching status in 1998. She's been a mentor to many teachers after her. She's participated in several kindergarten orientations. She transferred to center school as a first grade teacher in 2007. She remains there today. She plans to retire on July 3rd. Tremendous loss to the district. She's also uh, been an active representative of the union as well. Dear Dr. Cabral, members of the Eastern School Committee, I'm writing to inform you of my intent to retire from the Eastern Public Schools on July 3rd, 2020. I have truly enjoyed working in the Eastern Public Schools and I, and I sincerely appreciate all of the support that was provided to me during my 34 years here. I began working in the single project early preschool classroom, now the Eastern Public Schools preschool, <coughs> at Center School in September of 1986. At that time, the program was run by the Project Spoke Collaborative. I bet you, some of you know about Project Spoke. <laughs> Throughout the years that followed, the preschool moved to Parkview then to Northeastern Grammar School, and then to Morrow Hall. In 1995, Eastern Public Schools took over the program and eventually moved back to Center School. During that time, the program grew into several classrooms taught by many talented, caring teachers. I was teaching and serving as program coordinator at that time. It was a wonderful experience where I learned so much from so many amazing colleagues. In 2007, an opportunity arose to transfer to grade one at Center School. I was thrilled to be able to take on this challenge after teaching for 20 years in the preschool. I have loved every moment of teaching at this grade level, and again, I learned so much from the wonderful professionals that surrounded me. I consider myself so very fortunate to have spent almost my entire teaching career in the town of Easton. In the early years, as I was continually being moved from school to school, people would ask if I minded being uprooted every summer. <coughs> my honest answer was no, because those moves afforded me the opportunity to work with so many more teachers, paraprofessionals, 
custodians and administrators than I would have ever been able to had I stayed in one building all of those years. As much as I have made so many friendships and learned so many new things from the incredible professionals that make up the Eastern Public School staff, I have truly been blessed. Thank you so much for all the support that you have given me throughout my years in Easton. I have thoroughly enjoyed every moment and I am looking forward to what the future will bring, Karen Lent. I made it through without crying, so that was good. Um, Karen's awesome, worked with her for many years. She is involved with the EEA and uh, she's just a dynamite teacher in person. Anybody else? Well, I, she is definitely one of those teachers that you hear about. Parents are so excited when they, their child has been assigned to her, for, you know, beginning first grade. So um, it is a great loss to the district. Certainly. I tried to entice her with a new building. She wasn't biting. <laughs> <laughs> but I can't blame her. I'm very happy for her. Uh, be reading in her classroom. It's actually, again, and I'm looking forward to it. It's always a pleasure to walk into that very calm environment of her classroom. I was just going to add that I hope she leaves the pixie dust that she has um, because she certainly does have pixie dust in her classroom when um, whenever you enter, just the students are just so calm and engaged and it's just a wonderful environment. So we will miss her deeply. Except, except for when they're waiting for the eggs to hatch. Oh, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of crazy. Uh, we actually have two speech and language pathologists. Joyce Greenwald has been with the district for 26 years. She began her, began her time in Easton as a speech and language pathologist. <coughs> she earned her professional teaching status in 1997. She served as a mentor, and in 2000, she moved to Center School, where she remains today. She plans to retire on June 30th. <coughs> Dear Dr. Cabral and members of the Easton School Committee, I am writing to inform you of my intent to retire from the Easton Public Schools on June 30th. Some years back, I was asked which job I would choose if I could choose any job. For me, it was an easy question to answer. This was the job for me. I found my work challenging and rewarding. It was a job that allowed for collaboration with so many talented and caring people. The children were the icing on the cake, each one special and unique. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for this opportunity. It's been a privilege working for the Eastern Public Schools. I take with me wonderful memories of a great career. This was the job for me, Joyce Greenwald. And again, another fabulous teacher. Um, <coughs> I again worked with her for many years and she was also part of the EEA um, in the board and stuff. Um, but she just, she always got involved, always, you know, made, made her presence known. So it was nice. Anybody else? Clearly uh, loves children, loves her job, and. We love her, and <laughs> another great loss to the district. <coughs> another speech and language pathologist, Ruth Bluestone, has been with the district for 20 years. Ruth's been working at the Parkview School as a speech and language pathologist. She received her professional teaching status in 2003. She plans to retire on June 30th. Dear Ruth Doctor, already oh, began, oh, sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I think it's important to note that she already began the next stage of her career, she's working for Emerson College, yeah. teaching in their online uh, speech pathology master's program, so her influence is not going to end. Dear Dr. Cabral, please accept this letter as my resignation for the purpose of retirement from the Easton School District. I will retire at the end of the school year, officially June 30th, 2020. I have loved working in Easton, and the last 20 years has been the best part of my career as a speech pathologist. I have worked with truly exceptional colleagues and have been supported by principals and administrators who have given me wonderful opportunities to grow. I have begun the next stage of my career working for Emerson College teaching for their online speech pathology master's program. This position will allow me to train future speech pathologists across the country and use the knowledge I have gained over my years in Easton. <coughs> it will also allow me to travel and visit my beloved South Africa as well as my friends and family all over the world. I am sad that I will not have the opportunity to work at the new Easton Early Elementary School, but as an Easton resident, I will stay involved in the project. Ruth Bluestone. And I'm very happy to see that Ruth is here this evening. Retirement's great. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Thank you, Ruth. Carolyn. Congratulations. I just want to say I've gotten to know Ruth, I've got to know Ruth a little bit through a, new, a wonderful new organization raising multicultural kids, and I found her to be an extremely thoughtful but totally child focused individual. So it is another great loss, although I'm sure you're going to find lots of great new speech pathologists. Yes, send them our way. Okay. <laughs> Me too. Um, okay, add, we um, have, go ahead. I just want to add that. Um, uh, Mrs. Bluestone was part of the, um, the team for one of my kids when he was going through uh, support services at Parkview many years ago. She was um, incredibly helpful, um, very uh, creative and innovative, and even without you know, a formal diagnosis at the time, was so willing to offer a lot of solutions that, that helped my child, and I know so many. And I also want to thank you for um, all the times over the years you've done workshops for mm -hmm. the PAC and for the Special Ed PAC. It's been really valuable to the community. All right, I'm going to make a motion that we accept Ruth Bluestone, Joyce Greenwald, Karen Lund, Cheryl Corkum, and Jane Demling uh, retirement letters and accept with, do I say with regret? Absolutely. Accept with regret. That's motion. Second. All those in favor. And we wish every one of these people the best of luck. Absolutely. All right, it is 7.30. So at this time, we do have, I don't know exactly how many, well, I can count them up, but we have a lot of presentations. <coughs> you will have three to five minutes to come up and present. We'll go sit out there. Um, and then we'll just have quick questions and answers afterwards um, for anybody that wants to, you know, to say anything. Um, we've got to keep it tight, though, because <coughs> we do have a lot of people. Um, and the first one that's going to be up is the uh, McKenna's Blanche Ames. Siobhan McKenna, um, and I've been an Eastern resident for 23 years. I graduated from All Brains High School in 2015 and Stonehill College in 2019. I am currently working as a U.S. history teacher at North Attleboro High School. Um, my topic of my senior thesis was Blanche A. Ames, and through my research, I discovered her amazing contributions to the field of engineering, the fight for women, uh, women's suffrage, and more personally for us, to the town of East. I'm advocating for a new elementary school to be named after Blanche because of the powerful and positive impact of sharing her story with all of our youngest learners, but possibly mostly for our youngest girls. Her story intertwines with many other stories, those within our town's history, but also stories of our nation's history and the pioneer path she helped to form for women in STEM fields. Among her amazing, uh, many contributions, was the paradigm shift in public support of women's rights resulting in the right to vote for women, the engineering marvels that she invented. I would like to personally thank the individuals who have written letters of endorsement for the naming of the school, Catherine Honey, Kevin Friend, Paul Clifford, and Suzanne Buck. Why should you give Blanche a chance? 
I am proposing that by naming our school after Blanche, our little learners will be inspired by Blanche and other trailblazing women in the field of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Considering that it is the centennial anniversary of the 19th Amendment, what more beautiful way to honor our pioneers and suffragists than to name the school after Blanche. I believe we should recognize our town's history, and Blanche deserves this recognition for her own ingenuity. Lastly, I will address students' curiosity for uncovering the truth about history and learning about the women that have always been at the forefront of invention, but have not always had that recognition. The Massachusetts Board of Education addresses that in order to be successful citizens, students of Massachusetts have to be prepared with the skills in STEM fields. The best way to prepare our students for this is to give them early exposure to it. But how do we support an entire gender identity that feels um, that our society and our institutions have re reinforced that girls aren't interested in or don't belong in STEM fields? Well, we send an inclusive message and we educate them about a female inventor, engineer, architect that lived in our very own town, Blanche Abrams. Blanche held four patents. She had members of the Pentagon visit Borderland Mansion to see her design to ensnare low-flying plan enemy planes during World War II. She designed an eco-friendly toilet. She was the master architect of Borderland Mansion. She was a mother of four, all while showing that women are inventors, creators, artists, technicians, and discoverers. She was a female in STEM, and she holds her roots in Easton. As someone who has lived in Easton my entire life, I take pride in my town's history. Some might feel that this is not the time to name another building after any of us, but we cannot deny the immense contributions the Ames family have provided the town of Easton. And specifically, Blanche's contributions have yet to be recognized. As a high schooler, I love the stories that started when I said I was from Olive Rains High School and not just Easton High School. Our schools open up a discussion about our town's history, and our town's history tells a story. It's a story that creates our identity, and I believe we have the opportunity to now create this new early elementary school's identity. By naming the school after Blanche, I believe we can support our little learners for an ever-changing world that's based on technology, AI, engineering, and science. It's time to celebrate women's contributions that have historically been unheard. We are in a movement of celebrating women that have been hidden. At the end of the day, Blanche wanted to give women a voice. She wanted to give them a role model to look to, one that excelled in STEM. She believed that women had the right to vote, to assert their intelligence, and to break gender barriers. This is powerful, and this is the power of an education. Thank you for your time, and please give Blanche a chance. Uh, questions? Okay. So next, we actually have two people presenting for the next name. Um, we have the Almedas and we have Hazel Varela. So, you the Almedas? Yes. Do you want to go first or do you want Hazel to go first? Alphabetical order. Okay. Do you need the um, computer? No. Okay. I'm a little hard of hearing, so if you have any questions, you have to speak up. Uh, thank you very much for having me. I'm a life member. My name, by the way, I'm sorry, is Don Almeida. We'll get that straight. I'm a life member of the Friends of Borderland, a life member of the Natural Resources Trust, and a member of the Friends of the Library. I'm also a homeowner in the Ames Historic District where my house was built in 1831 on Main Street next to Quisit Brook, which is now Langwater Pond. My maternal grandparents <clears throat> arrived in this country in 1899 then migrated to a bucolic Easton 106 years ago in 1914 to escape an urban setting with their firstborn, my mother, who became the oldest of 11 children. I was born in a house at 25 Center Street in North Easton, 79 years ago, within the shadow of the magnificent Ames Family Institutions of Learning. 
the first Oliver Ames High School, the Northeastern Grammar School, and the Ames Free Library. It was fairly common back then to be born in a house rather than a hospital, but not on a beautiful campus disguised as the center of a small town. My extended family, our friends, and everyone we knew in town had a wonderful story about Mrs. Frothingham, as she was called back then. Stories I could not, could not only, stories that I not only heard, but personally experienced as a growing <coughs> child. Stories that were always about children. And I include all of those townspeople who knew her, were touched by her, and have since passed away. Many of their names appear on our veterans' memorials. Some are inscribed at the town office building, and most are on monuments erected in our local cemeteries, which means none of, none of these people can speak for her. If they knew I was speaking for them, I'm sure they would enthusiastically approve. As children, her benevolence and quiet humility contributed to our personal heritage and well-being. As adults, her name remains powerful and indelible. Let it always be said that her name should forever be remembered in association with the history of Easton's children and all future generations of children in this town. That remembrance in perpetuity could only be fitting by placing her name on a school where children learn. Every person who grew up in Easton since the early part of the 20th century, every person, until their passing was touched by her generous philanthropy because of her passion for children and for learning. Her annual Christmas party for all elementary schools was held in the auditorium at the first Oliver Ames High School where she and Santa Claus personally handed out wrapped presents to each and every child in town. She was also remembered for driving around in her electric car in the 1920s and 1930s, handing out nickels to poor but laughing children who greeted her as she drove through their neighborhoods. Back then, a nickel would buy a loaf of bread. This electric car story could have been lost and buried away if it wasn't for my late mother and late aunts and uncles, uncles who later went off to war and who would never forget her generosity. From her, they learned about kindness, hope, and giving during harsh times when families were struggling for years and Christmas was simply a date on a calendar without much joy and family gifts for children and when walking to church on a cold winter's day or night was the norm. Yet Mrs. Frothingham was their gift, far beyond a wrapped present under a tree. The Lewis A. Frothingham Memorial Park and the Frothingham Memorial Hall originally an adjunct gymnasium and basketball court, spawned many scholar athletes and housed the local Boy Scout group <coughs> for meetings in addition to other town activities. The park, as it was called, was the setting for observances on Memorial Day and Armistice Day, which is now Veterans Day. Her modesty would not allow her to attend these colorful ceremonies. I recall a small airplane flown from the Ames Airport, now Stonehill College, flew low and dropped a wreath to the officials and to the World War I and World War II veterans reverently standing below. Most of these veterans, some disabled, were once the town school children touched by Mrs. Frothingham and who now stood proudly at that park dedicated in her late husband's name. Their names now appear on our veterans' memorial. As a child, I knew these people and are no, and who are no longer with us to speak on her behalf. And as a veteran, and one whose name is also on that memorial, I'm here to speak for them. It's now time to dedicate the passion of Mary Ames Frothingham's life in perpetuity by naming a school after her that teaches children. Thank you very much. Ready? Yep. Do you want to use the computer? Is she? No. 
I'm going to repeat some of the things that the gentleman just said because I would like to recommend the Guardian for Early Education Children in Easton for more than 40 years, Mary Ames Brockingham. I would really like to mention four things. The first is that in 1869, a building, a wooden building was constructed across from the rosary, across from the rockery, and there were 14 graves. Then, when Oliver Ames High School was built, that wooden building was dragged closer to Barrow Street, and it was still the elementary school. Mary Ames, she hadn't married Mr. Frothingham yet, went in about 1912, and she was horrified. It was not a 20th century educational place. She decided with her brothers, John and Lothrop, to build a 20th century school, the Northeastern Grammar. And that was done deliberately to compensate. The second, as mentioned, she felt that every child should have a Christmas gift. And therefore, what she did is decide and she did this for more than 40 years. From about 1912, she died in 1955. She would decide on a truck, a new kind of truck, model truck, and every boy would get one. And for a girl, obviously a doll. Those would be bought in the summer, and she and her staff would hand wrap every one of those gifts for every student here in Easton, particularly elementary. As indicated, there would be a big party the last day of school before Christmas. There would be a magician, there would be ice cream, and then there would be the gift. But what about the outlying schools? Well, we came to Easton in 1945, and my dad's responsibility was to take all the gifts to the outlying schools with money to pay for the ice cream and cake. So every child, particularly, eventually it became K through three, received a special gift just before Christmas. That was important to her. Next, the park, as mentioned. It was obviously built to honor the Congress. <coughs> he was an outstanding athlete at Harvard. He was not only the captain of the senior baseball team, he was captain at the as a junior, which is extraordinary. <coughs> the focus was athletics. But what about her children? So what was arranged was there's a separate cha se section for children. We all know it. There's a road in between, and as you picture it, the swings are not right beside that road. They're a distance away. No child is going to be hit by a bat or a ball. That was deliberately done by Mary Ames Frothingham, that the children of Easton would have a place to play, while their older brothers and sisters were playing baseball, whatever else. The last thing I want to mention is the Ames Free Library and a neighbor. The next time you go to the town office, that was Mrs. Frothingham's home, look to the left. See if you can see a medieval castle up on a hill. I won't ask you to put up your hand if you remember seeing it. That was built in 1895 for William Hadwin Ames. Mr. Ames was the oldest child of the governor, and he was a great industrialist. In 1915, his wife Mary died. And the next year, he marries 
a lady who's about half his age, Fanny Holt. And it was a wonderful relationship. Unfortunately, he died by 1918, less than two years. Fanny Holt, Ames, and Mary Ames Frothingham as neighbors became great friends. They used to walk their property together, talk about, obviously, the interests of the day. The children. Neither had a child, but children were important. And in 1928, the congressman died. Mrs. Frothingham is dealing with, obviously, the death. She's working on the pop. And she knows that soon she's going to be president of the Ames Free Library. Her brother Oliver is quite ill. And she had told Danny Holt Ames, I don't know how many times, that her one concern at the library was lack of effective children's services. There were two shelves, if you can picture, on the main floor at that time, the circulation desk. And just to the left were two shelves with children's books. They had boxes and boxes in the cellar, and what they do is rotate on the <coughs> shelves. The classics would be rotated among the schools. Mary Ames Rothingham was determined that when she became president, that she would do something about this. And she shared that, obviously, with Fanny Holding. One day, Fanny came to Mrs. Frothingham and said, I've got the solution to the children's problem. In a couple of years, she, Fanny Holt Haynes, planned to move to Vermont with her sister. But she was determined before she left that she would do something in her husband's name, William Hadwin Haynes. She would pay for a room to be added to the library. And she asked Mary Ames Frothingham, is that possible? And Mary said, well, there are legal things we have to look at in regard to the deed. There's a whole architectural thing. This is a Richardson building. And Mary indicated that she would pay for all of the expenses, she herself, not the library, to facilitate the children's room. So once all of the loopholes were taken care of, the children's room was built. And as you all know, it's named for William Hadwin Ames. Fanny did go to Vermont uh, before she left. She left two really um, sizable endowments to the library, which are still being used today. And she would come back every year for a special occasion. That room, William Hadwin Ames Children's Room, was very important to her. So the effects today in 2020 <coughs> caused by Mrs. Frothingham is, first of all, the pop. And the new school is going to be relatively close to that. Obviously, they can use the facilities. And keep in mind that the park is 90 years old this year. And it's, other than CPA grants, all of the money has come out of the Frothingham Trust. It's something that we enjoy, be us children or what. The other, obviously, is the Fanny Hope Children's Room. <coughs> the children's room today is used for so many things you'd be amazed. And we're very fortunate because of the influence of Mary Ames Frothingham on the children of Easton. And I think that if you decide to honor <coughs> someone, it should be somebody who really was involved for decades in regard to the early education of children. Thank you for your listening. Mary Tarraka, you are next, <laughs> and you're an entourage. <laughs> are you going to use the computer?
forgetting my sign in. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Nobody's watching, and Jeannie. A, and a, oh and no pressure. I know MA for before you I'm like it every day of my life. More <laughs> no. No. <laughs> you should not be nervous. <laughs> Go look into the search and type in the name. <laughs> Committee for affording us the opportunity to speak tonight. We are here to honor Sarah L. Gallagher and to ask you for your consideration in naming the new elementary school after an educator who has had and continues to have an impact on education in Easton. It is our privilege to share our respect for Sarah with you all tonight. Sarah had an exemplary 35 year career in Easton as a student teacher, as a teacher, and then as a principal for 20 years. Her dedication to Easton began as an undergraduate at Stonehill College. Upon her graduation, she was immediately hired by Easton Public Schools and continued to be an unwavering proponent of the Easton Public School System for the remainder of her career. Why Sarah? She was a beloved female educator. Currently, we have six schools in Easton none of which are named for an educator and none for a woman. We now have the opportunity to change that and to name the new building after this remarkable woman educator, Sarah Louise Gallagher. Sarah was highly respected. She was a calm, supportive, guiding light to students, families, and teachers, always creating a warm, welcoming environment that fostered enthusiastic teaching and learning. Most important was Sarah's advocacy for children's rights. Everything was done with children's best interest as a priority. She was devoted to ensuring academic excellence entwined with caring child development. Sarah's influence is timeless. She personifies the current core values of the Eastern Public Schools, safety and respect, communication and collaboration, leading by example, and continuous growth. I didn't have the honor to work in a building with Sarah's principal, but I consider myself so very fortunate to have worked with Sarah on the English Language Arts Committee. She was the co-chair of Stellar, and some of you remember this. <laughs> um, for two years, I worked with her to develop um, our English Language Act curriculum that came out in 1996. I'm not gonna pass it around because I'm the only one still teaching. <laughs> She exemplified continuous growth, emphasizing that curriculum is a fluid document and a living document. I credit Sarah with my love of curriculum and for inspiring me to remain involved in the initiatives of the school system. Sarah was a model of integrity and respect for me and for so many other educators. She represents all of the Eastern educators, past, present, and future, many of whom are here tonight or have, ex or have expressed their support through letters and emails which we have for you. Now we would like to share with you a short clip from Sarah's retirement party in April 1997. Former Superintendent Dr. Bill Simmons is speaking to a group of over 350 attendees. I promise to be kind and gentle. I have some additional thoughts to share on a more serious note. As I indicated earlier, this is by far the largest retirement turnout that I have seen, I think, since Don Moscato's retirement dinner dance. 
People are here tonight because Sarah, during her 35 years as a teacher and an administrator in the Eastern Public Schools, has influenced in an immensely positive way the lives of thousands of children and adults. I'm sure there were many times, Sarah, during those 35 years that you wondered, am I doing the job well? Am I being the teacher, administrator, the children's advocate, the role model that you hope to be? And if your efforts were making the difference that you wanted in the lives of children for whom you're responsible? Well, the genuine care and thoughts expressed tonight, the turnout itself, the representation from so many different paths and walks of life, and the memories of tonight's tribute create a wonderful testimony to you that you will certainly recall each and every day of your life. Sarah chose to spend her career helping others. Her legacy is not only how well she did that, but the number of lives that she touched, shaped, and even changed through the example she set every one of those 35 years in Easton. The town of Easton and the Easton Public Schools will certainly miss you, Sarah. I will miss your involvement as a friend as a supporter, as a confidant, and as a mentor. I wish you the very best. And as we've talked, as you move on to your next stage, whatever it will be, I'm sure will be in some way in a helping profession, and in some way you'll continue to touch new lives for many, many years to come. Thank you, sir. Please carefully consider naming the new elementary school to honor Sarah Gallagher, a dedicated woman who served our school system for 35 years with vigor and enthusiasm. Let us honor an unsung hero, a humble woman who rose to be both a direct influence on the lives of so many children and an inspiration to the working teachers who continue to silently and humbly invest their lives in our children and in our future. Although the school would have her name, her name represents all of us, all the members of the Eastern Public Schools community. Oh, we, sorry. One, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, we have a packet of additional information. I left it right in front of your spot, Nancy. Okay. For each member, for each of you. Um, it's mainly a collection of letters and emails from supporters. We hope that you were able to find the time to look through them. And we thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Thank you. So Denise Pineda put in um, Susanna Ames Elementary, and I guess she couldn't be here tonight, and I don't have any other emails on that. Okay, next up is uh, Sharon Ateo. No, she's not here? Okay. She's at home. She's what? She just had surgery, so she can't oh, make it. Okay, I'll read her email in a minute, okay? I'll read her thing. Thank you, though. Um, <coughs> Is Bill Donahue here? Bill Donahue? No? Okay. Um, Nellie Brennan Hall. Right here. Okay? Do you need a computer? No, I don't. Oh, okay. Yeah, first of all, um, excuse my voice, I'm just getting over a cold. Um, but I do first want to thank all of my presenters. It's been really interesting to hear about these different times of Eastern history, and I'm kind of taking this in a different direction in terms of historical representation. So, as you know, three of Eastern schools are named after people connected to the Ames family. Governor Oliver Ames, Frederick Law Olmsted, and H.H. H. Richardson. The latter two who were commissioned by the Ames family to produce public buildings and landscapes in an effort to clear the name of Oaks Ames who had been involved in a national scandal. Often in Easton, we focus on the 19th century heyday, which saw the Ames family and the Ames shovel shop as putting Easton on the map. How, and that's okay to celebrate that. <laughs> However, this celebration of wealthy white 19th century individuals has included a deeper history of Easton and its multicultural future. Therefore, I propose the name Metacomet Elementary School for our new school. For those of you who don't know, 
Metacomet was a great sachem, or chief, of the Wampanoag tribe. He is said to have been born in the Furnace Brook area of Easton in 1638. Long before Easton was incorporated as a town, Metacomet and his father, Massasoit, led a proud Wampanoag tribe, rich in culture and language. The Wampanoags cultivated this land, fished these lakes and rivers, and they conducted a sophisticated society in which women owned property and served as sachems themselves. European colonists began to expand into Wampanoag land, and their friendly relationship soon ended. The settlers began to take away the rights of the Native Americans. At this point, Metacomet led a valiant effort to unite several Native American tribes against expansion. <coughs> He used part of Easton as a headquarters for his troops. <coughs> Disease and violence led to the deaths of most of the Wampanoags, and Metacomet was eventually captured and killed. However, I propose this name here because I think it's important to remember Easton's whole history. I want Easton's youngest children to know that there was a vibrant culture and language of proud and intelligent people who lived here and thrived here. I want the new name of our school to recognize the native heritage and the indigenous land on which we now live. I want to say to our students that there was once a great sachem who was born here and who lived here. If we say, as a school district and a community, that we value multiculturalism and all heritages, let's make this clear with the name of our new school. Thanks. Kevin White here. Good evening, everybody. I'll try, I, I can never make these things quick, but I'll try and make them entertaining so it feels a little quick. Um, You're on the clock. This process has been pretty amazing. I'm glad that the community has been involved. I've, I've been in the process of the design of this school, right? So when we brought the community in, it was fantastic to get all of that input. So I find this process to be pretty amazing too, that everybody's got these different perspectives. If you read online the, the conversations that are happening, you hear things like, eh, let's just call it Easton. Right? Easton Elementary, and you go, great. And I say to myself, yeah, maybe. But that's an opportunity that's lost. And we do have an opportunity here. Is it the biggest one in the world? Does the world collapse if we don't take the most of it? No. But we have an opportunity here, right? To do something with the name of this school. And this is, this is a generational opportunity, right? We probably are not gonna spend another 90 million years, maybe long after some of us are gone or some of us have moved on, right? So we have an opportunity here to create something that's incredibly lasting. Now with that opportunity, we can have probably four different priorities of how are we gonna name this thing? What's it gonna do? And one priority is typical. You've seen it happen here. It's happened in every, and they're all great examples. Let's honor someone. There's, there should be someone so apparent that we should give the designation of their name to this school. And that should exist, and that should be there. So sometimes that's the priority. We have someone we must name this after. Sometimes it's, we must honor our history. And we've heard a lot about that. Amazing, amazing history we've heard from everyone, right? So let's honor the history of this town. Sometimes it's, let's just honor our own community. Who exists here now? What are we all about? What will we be about? Where can we go? Right, but to put our name, Easton, on that stamp. And so that's how we say, well, the community is our priority. But to me, there's a fourth priority. And it, I think is the most important of those, and that is the mission of this school. The mission of this school is simple. We are attempting to ignite in our kids, the youngest kids, the first time that they have to learn, to ignite a passion around learning, a lifelong curiosity about learning. We are trying to ignite in them this feeling of, I love this school, I love exploring, I love innovating, I love questioning. And this is when you get them, right? Kindergarten, first grade, second grade. You get them after that, might be even too late at that point to ignite that. So we have this opportunity and these four priorities. Okay? So I say to myself, if we were to name this, if we were to take the most advantage of this opportunity, we would do something that incorporates all four of those. That would be the sweet spot. Can something, can something truly encapsulate all four of those priorities? 
Now, quite honestly, and this is my opinion, that's why I'm up here and giving this pitch, um, I personally think that the lowest priority is probably at this point, since nothing stands out, nothing is right in front of us, the honoring of someone as a priority, it's still there. We should speak to it. We should speak to people who came before. But I would put the mission as the highest, and then the town, the community, and our history and DNA as somewhere in the middle. So I think about that. I think about those four priorities. The people, the genesis, and <coughs> the spark. Right? Who, cre who created the Big Bang? Who started this town? We've learned there was a culture long before us, and everything that they ignited in a culture. And there was a second round of culture that came, and we have these prominent families like Ames and Frothingham, each who gave their own boost, right? Each who gave something and left a legacy to give energy to this town, put us on the map. And those are some of the people that we think of when we think, let's honor those people. And then what about our town's history? I think about the old forge, right? I think about Foundry Street. I think about manufacturing. I think about the grit and the sweat, the World War II, and even currently now that we build things, we make things here. Hammer to steel, right? We bang on it and we do it until it's right. And that's, I think, an Eastern grit. I think it's like, that's in our DNA. And I like that about us. And I like that about the town. And it means something to us. I think if we were to speak to our community right now, what we think about this school has an opportunity to think, to, to, to coalesce everyone around this school. If you know the design, you know there's a community aspect built into it. It's meant to have a community center. It's meant to be used not just as an elementary school, but to be built and used by the community itself to bring it together, to ignite conversation, celebration, debate, right? Competition, performance, whatever we do in that school as a community afterwards, that's something we want to celebrate. But we also want to put Easton back on the map. We want to proclaim our pride. We want to say Easton. And look at what we're producing here in Easton. Look at these kids from Easton. So I see that as an important part. But the mission is the most, to me, the most important. How do you make kids realize and understand the position they are in life? of learning and what this means, of curiosity and what this means. How do you let the teachers who show up every day to know it is their mission to light something in these kids that make them go, I am going to be curious for the rest of my life, and to send them on a trajectory, to shoot them on a path of success. <coughs> the kids should be reminded every day when they walk in of that mission. The teachers should be reminded every day when they walk in of that mission and the community should know every day, why did we spend this money on this school? What are we trying to do with it? So, what does all that? Right? What incorporates the, the, the history of the spark of the genesis, the Ames family, shovels? I think of the Transcontinental Railroad and, and, and shovel hitting rock across the entire country. Right? And what happens when that, when that occurs? And, and the shovel works and the manufacturing, the foundry, and the sparks, and the building, and all of this, right? I think of that history and of those people who created this, and I think of a word. And I think of manufacturing, and I think of sweat and toil and grit and determination, and I think of a word. <coughs> and I think about what we're trying to do with the community, and not only right now, but not the past, what we're trying to do with the community and go forward with this building and how innovative it is. And then I think of the mission, right? And lighting a fire in these kids. And I think of one word. So, I'm going to so entirely be different here. This is not the name of a person. But this is a name that I think reclaims our community, name, speaks to the mission, talks our past, and praises our community. It's very non-traditional, but I think it may work. So I would like to put forth the name Easton's Spark Elementary. If you can envision a spark flying as the diagonal in an A in that spark, call it the Ames A, call it whatever you'd like, the trajectory of a kid and his path on learning. This to me 
brings pride and joy. It explains itself in one word. A name should never just be, you have to sit and explain it for 10 minutes as to why it was named. <coughs> you should feel it. I know my, my, one of my daughters is a Parkview panda, and she loves being a panda day in and day out. The power of mascots are everything, and I could find nothing cooler than being eight and being a spark. I just think of all of these iconography that you can do and all the celebration that it has, and I'd love to let this building be something that ignites something in us. Thank you for this. Presenting. I didn't register. I didn't register, but I'd like to present. Okay, go ahead. Sure. My name is Bill Ains. I'm not uh, going to one of my relatives, so I may not get invited next week. I think it's somewhat different, but anyway. Uh, for the name of the new school, I would like to suggest the Jim Craig School. Jim's impressive journey into American sports history while began while he was playing hockey on the ponds in the woods off North Main Street. That continued as he progressed through the Eastern schools. As for some background, Jim and his family lived on North Main Street. His grandfather, Craig, emigrated from Nova Scotia and was a talented landscape artist. His dad worked in the shovel factories here and also had a passion for public service. He served on the Board of Health for 30 years and was on the school committee with my father during the construction of the Center Street School. Jim graduated from OA and went to Boston University. He made the Olympic team as the goalie for the 1980 games. In the final game against the heavily favored Russian team, the score was tied with five seconds left. In the legendary words of the announcer, Eurozoni Ur has the puck, and there's five seconds left. Do you believe in miracles? Yes! Ruzioni scores! Jim was the goalie for that game, and it is forever referred to as the miracle on ice. In the dark days of the Cold War, when the Russians were regularly threatening us, a collection of college kids beat a team of Russian professionals. It is regarded as one of the greatest gold medal victories in America's Olympic history. On Saturday night, February 22nd, about a week or so from today, it will be the 40th, 40 years since that epic evening in Lake Placid. Sports teaches kids many life lessons <coughs> as they progress through their school days. They help children develop physical skills, get exercise, make friends, have fun, learn teamwork, learn to play fair, and improve, most of all, improve self-esteem. Children can dream of Olympic gold medals or just play on a team to have a fun time. Jim's story, and thus his name, are emblematic of a journey we all embark upon early in our lives. Thank you. So I'll read those to you. Nancy, yeah. I can, I can call. I would like to say a few words. Okay, go ahead. Say, would you mind? Yep. Um, my name is Ed Lummish. Uh, I had the honor of going to Olive Williams High School, and I, my wife said, you've got to go up there and tell them your story. My, I'd like to speak in extemporaneously. Uh, uh, I, I had a stroke, so I'm not going to stand up. Um, on what the Ames family has meant to my family. Um, my parents came over here, the Jumalovichs, my mother and father came over here to Ellis Island to work at the, the Ainses. My grandmother worked as a maid in the town office building. My grandfather worked making shovels in the shovel shop. My other parents from, came from Poland. Uh, they also came to Ellis Island. So when I grew up in the duplex house, that was sold to my grandparents who worked in the shovel shop pond, one of the historic duplex houses, uh, for a minimal amount of money. What my grandfather made $14 a week, was it Hazel? Yeah, $14 a week. Uh, 
Well, my grandparents grew up on one side, my mother and father, my two sisters, and I grew up on the other side. My cousins grew up on the other duplex, Sullivan's, and my second cousins, the Reeds, grew up on the other side. And if it weren't for the Ames family, we'd, no, we'd not end up where we ended up today. Um, I don't have all the articulate words. I had them when I was younger. I don't have all the articulate words and uh, the really beautiful analogies to draw uh, for what happened. But what basically happened was is that my grandparents grew up. I went to Frothingham Park. <coughs> and we had Frothingham Park. We had the, the hall that they talked about across the street from the, uh, the uh, old Oliver Rings, the original Oliver Rings High School. Those were all given by Minnie Frothingham. Minnie Frothingham lived two houses up from me in a single family home. She was head of the library. She didn't live upstairs like everybody thought she did. She had her own little house right up on Lincoln Street. And every morning during the summer, I would go up there. She was a librarian. I would go up to the, her house, and she would show me around the gardens, what, the, what, weeds, what weeds looked like, and to pull those things. And then she worked at the library for the Ames family. And I learned that a boss is a proper name for a vase. When I went home, I told my mom, Mom, you're calling that thing the wrong thing. It's a boss. My mother looked, and looked at me, and she goes, well, OK. And, and I learned an awful lot. Minnie Frothingham was to eventually leave her property to my Aunt Nell, Helen Menick, up in New Hampshire, 28 acres. We had an iridescent moss on the farm. The only thing my Aunt Nell was worried about was getting the barn covered so the iridescent moss wouldn't disappear. Rather than put her money into the, the farmhouse, she didn't. My Aunt Nell was sent to uh, Simmons College in Boston by, the Ames, by Minnie Frothingham, the Ames family, as well as numerous other kids were sent to colleges. I can name it when I went to high school, higher tuitions paid and board and room paid for by the Ames family. How many scholarships they gave? John Sedell, Eddie Meehan, um, uh, just to name a couple. But I could name one from every class that got a scholarship. And some of those kids tried to pay that money back to the Ames to give the scholarship back to the school so it could be relocated to someone else in the future. I learned great values growing up. We had Frothingham Park after I worked it for, uh, for Mary Lamprey. I was, she'd give me a nickel or a dime to go to the park. We played at the park all day, and I had to be home at 7 o'clock at night. My mother and father both worked. Minnie Frothingham came to our house, my grandparents' house. My mother told me the story. They parked the car that they used to like to ride around in, on, in the, up on the front lawn. And she came into the house and she sat down had a cup of tea with my grandparents. She said, uh, Helen's going to have to leave the home and stay in a Boston. I'm going to put her up at a boarding school in there because she, when you come back, she comes back here, you don't always speak English in the house. And her English grade is down, but her other grades are up very well. She's doing very, very well. So my aunt now rented her out a place to stay, a boarding house in Boston. And she came home once in a while on the trains to visit. She graduated with honor. My uncle Al, her brother, served in World War II, got the Navy Cross, came back here, worked for the town, voluntary fire department, was involved with the Ameses. Okay. Thank so, you. Thank you very uh, much. Uh, I'm not just saying. Okay. You know, you know, we have gentlemen, some people stand up, and I'm not trying to be discourteous, but they, what they do is they stand up and they don't understand what the Ames family meant. You know? Uh -huh. uh, they were just wonderful people. So is your nomination for Mary Ames Frothingham, for Blanche Ames? Or uh, Blanche Ames. Most Susanna of them, Ames. I don't remember that much about Blanche. I said I was not a historian of that. All I know what went on in my household <coughs> growing up as a kid right. okay. and what I saw. And I can't attest to every particular moment, et cetera, or how, how far the swings were from the witch car. I know I swang the, uh, uh, you know, with the rings, we had the things and everything else. Like that. But what I'm saying to you is that we needed to have those things, and they always provided the facility right. for it. Thank okay? you. Okay, and you know so, Nancy, because I you were there. I do know. Thank you very okay. much.
that's just coming up. Um, how do I make this work regular? You don't want me to help you? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> I want to help you, Jimmy. How do I make it regular? I don't know. I don't do this. Yeah. I don't have to do this anymore. <laughs> okay. All right. Oh, and that's the clip. What do I do just that? Yeah. Okay. Um, so we have Blanche A. Ames, Mary Ames Sprylingham, Sarah L. Gallio. I don't know anything. Um, did she? Denise? Denise, Denise. Hold on. I think Denise just said Suzanne Ames, and I didn't get anything else. Um, so this is from a sixth grader. Center View Hall. Or some other movement of the three, you know, center school, moral hall, park. So that was kind of cute. Um, this is Sharon. So let me um, just read her email. I would like to submit a name for consideration for the new elementary school. Unfortunately, she's unable to attend. So I should have known that. My strong preference for the new school would be to simply name it Easton Elementary School. The reason for this is because we, the entire town of Easton, came together as a community to work towards moving this vision of a new school forward. It wasn't a Northeastern or Southeastern decision. It wasn't a founding Ames decision. It wasn't an us versus them decision. It was one of Easton coming together as a community to do what's right for our future as a town. I understand other names have been tossed about for consideration, naming it after another Ames family member or after a former principal. Those are nice ideas, but honestly, that speaks to the past. This new school is the future. That's how it was designed. That, that's how it was marketed when looking for the town's people to vote for it. There are already plenty of Ames buildings in town. Let's let this new school represent the whole town in its entirety rather than naming it for an individual. Another solid reason to name the new school Easton Elementary School is to avoid hurting anyone's feelings. If you select one person's name over another, you have now alienated and hurt the supporters of any other name. It is we, the current taxpayers and residents of Easton, that will be paying for the school. I am Easton, my family is Easton, my neighbors are Easton. Naming the school Easton Elementary School is rightfully naming it for us. So I just want to thank Sharon and I hope you feel better. Okay. And I did also get some emails that were also on that same vein. Uh, Rob Gill, he wouldn't come in and present, he's out cleaning. Uh, the DJ Henry Elementary, and I think everybody knows about DJ, and, you know, as sad as that was. So, um, that a comment we had. Easton Spark Elementary. Um, Lorna, okay. This is from Lorna Payone, who was a former teacher at the Richardson Olmstead building. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, let's see. I would like to suggest that the new elementary school contain the word United. Easton United, Easton United Elementary, or simply United would relay the intent that Santa Morrow and Parkview Elementary children will be genu genuinely welcomed and equally united under one roof. We are a nation politically divided, Republicans and de Democrats. We are a community geographically, ge geographically divided, sorry, north and south. We were an upper middle elementary school, too long divided, purple and green. My motivation for the name has evolved over time. I started teaching in 1969 and became a resident in 1975. Back then, there was one Easton. My husband and I appreciated the small town environment of Easton, and our children thrived in the Easton schools. We truly enjoyed the community. Then something changed. As a resident, teacher, and parent within the town of Easton, I became acutely aware of the differences in zip codes within our town. When Richardson Olmsted opened, I was one of the original staff. The school was a modern, state-of-the-art building built for all the children of the town. But it was soon apparent that the children would be segregated within the walls of the school by color. As a teacher, I was painfully aware of the carefully planned separation of green and purple on playgrounds, in cafeteria seating, and of classroom placement simply because of zip codes. 
Now that my grandchildren are at RO, I am pleased to observe the children of Richardson Olmsted nonchalantly walking the green and purple tiles blissfully unaware of past color restrictions. My goal in adding United to the new school name may seem unnecessary, but the results are needed. The children of Center Morrow Parkview must unite as one student body instead of three. The families of both North and South must unite as one parent group instead of two or three. The tiles within the new building must display neutral unified colors for one and all. Eastern United would represent more than a name for our school. It would represent a way of life for our community and children. A mindset of unity, inclusion, equality, a guarantee of belonging, and a respect for all sides. It would represent a united entity of one student body, one parent group, one neutral life. That's from Lorna Pagel. Okay. And that's it. So, um, I will take some questions. Um, and then, we do have it on the agenda as a possible vote, although I'm certainly overwhelmed by all the presentations and thank you so much for, it was a great history lesson and a great wake up call for all of us, I think. So does anybody have any questions? Jane. I have one. Yep. So, it, this isn't related to any specific presentation, but I just wondered if the school committee, because I know you've talked about this a couple of times mm -hmm. at, at different meetings, if as a committee you've agreed to kind of, I don't know, like a set of criteria, uh, you know, what, when you, when you decide, is it just going to be, well, that's the name I like, or are you trying to achieve certain goals by picking a name? Well, I'll speak on my behalf and then others can chime in. Um, I believe, I, yes, huh? You can if you'd like. Sure, I love having my girls up here. Um, the thing is, I think we were kind of waiting for tonight to see what would come out. And like I said, I, I don't know that we can vote tonight because this, this was um, unbelievably overwhelming. This is great. And um, I would say, no, it's not just going to be like put them in a hat and pick one out. I think we have to discuss it at a, probably at an executive session meeting. Maybe, I don't know. But. Chime in, girls. Can't do an no. session for that. No. We can discuss that at a meeting. Oh, we can discuss it at a meeting. We don't have to be an executive session. No. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think that this was great. I've learned a lot tonight. Mm -hmm. um, but there is a lot of information, and I know I would like some time to just kind of. As I was listening to everybody, it's like, gee, could we just have like this giant <laughs> billboard and just go right. right in order with all these people yeah. that are, everybody's deserving? I mean. There, there are people that didn't even come up tonight that are deserving also. So it's very hard to um, name a school for sure. And uh, I believe we had talked about this at a recent meeting that uh, Richardson Olmsted was a contest in the sixth grade. To, and somebody came up with those two because that's, you know, when they went on those walking tours, they knew about Richardson, they knew about the Rockery and Olmsted and all that. So. We have so much history here in Easton. That's why we not we live here because of the history, but it's a beautiful town to be in. Well, and the only reason I said that, and it's not a perfect analogy, but it's like, when you have to pick anything, if you have, you know, when you have to choose a principal or, or you know, usually come up with what are the things that we're looking, what are we trying to achieve with this? And, and, I, and I think that would be part of our discussion when we sit down to kind of talk about all the presentations that we saw, or, you know, <coughs> many of us have other ideas as well, that we can kind of talk about what we want the naming of the school to mean and what we want it to represent. Caroline. Well, I have a little bit of a different idea. I don't know if anyone here or everyone here has heard of ranked choice voting. <laughs> But that's actually a type of voting that is beginning to uh, take off in smaller communities across the country, but it's where people can list their choices in order. And so then if you have a split vote, so you had 2-2-1 two, two, or whatever, the one would drop off, but people give their first, second, and third choice. And so the, if, if one drops off, then the next one, the second choice, 
votes move up. I, I, I'm not going to explain this very well, but I will bring you all the information about it. But it's actually a good way to, at least if you have a group of people voting, that everybody has some buy-in at the end, because it's almost always going to be at least a first or second choice of everyone in the group. Um, but I do agree we should wait to vote, and I also want to be able to read all of the letters and emails mm -hmm. that you know, we've been provided. And, and I have emails to share with you, too. So did we answer your question, Jane? Yeah. Okay. I wasn't going to give her one, so <laughs> I was going to keep two for myself. <laughs> any, are there any other questions? How, okay, Tim. How will you ultimately? What's the final vote? Who's? We are the final vote. You okay? The so five of us. All right. Okay. Scary. No. <laughs> <laughs> Up in the back. Is there any past president? Uh, any buildings in the town are near? <coughs> like how you know, for example, Center School. How did it get named? Did that kind of thing? Parkview. Any kind. Yeah. I mean. I don't think there's well, a precedent. We know, well, we know what. We know how RO was named, right? Pat was we know Richardson Olmstead was a contest. They picked the two, you know, the builder and the um, the, arc, uh, the, the architect and the landscaper. The, uh, landscaper. Um, all the Rains High School in, got named because... In terms because of the bylaws and that, how, how a name is oh, chosen, is there anything set uh, in the past? But I don't know. I, I'll ask Tim in one second. Ian. But if it was a contest, <laughs> School Say it again. Committee. The, school the school committee. committee. School committee. Mr. Brockman told me the school decided. committee assigned it. So the kids submitted it. Sixth the grade. Committee ultimately made right. the decision. Yes. So oh yes, 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 <coughs> yes. Right here, Mr. Ames, you had your hand up. No, it was kind of a tongue in cheek thing. So I'll pass. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I yeah. Okay, Tim, do you have any idea on naming of buildings in town? A precedent? Yeah. No. no. Center School is a geographic center of town. That's why that's Center School. It's right. Kind of, I guess it's obvious, but and Parkview was kind of close to the park. To the park so right. We, correct. Yeah, I guess it's obvious. Mar Hall was already named when we bought it. Right. So we had the history of the lack of creativity. The lack. Yeah, the history of the lack of creativity. There you go. Exactly. Like <laughs> that. But the other thing is too that we want to make a, a quick decision because Dr. Cabral said the better we, you know, as they get planning bills to be paid, things, if there's a name on the building, it just makes it easier all the way through. You can call it something, not, oh, the new school, or da 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 So, Carol? I was just going to say, the school committee also was responsible for naming the Eastern Middle School, and that was a discussion about, you know, a sort of logical, neutral thing. Mm -hmm. But the, I, I was actually on school committee for both Richardson and Hall. Well, then it was Richardson School, Olmstead School, and then of course um, Eastern Middle School. It's always been in my 27 years a school committee decision. And that went from Eastern Junior High to Eastern Middle School. There actually right. was an Eastern Middle right. School on Lincoln Street at one time. Right, that's right. right. But okay. that was only sixth grade and two fifth grade. There you go. <laughs> well, it, it, it's had its little things going mm -hmm. around. Uh, okay, Mr. Levish. This is the last real naming of any building that we have is any significance. In other words, we've had people who have worked in the school department who have done an outstanding job who usually name something like this is the uh, name in honor of the superintendent of schools who did an outstanding job for us. Um, we had that. But we've had other principals like we've had uh, Mrs. Gurney at the uh, mm -hmm. elementary school. Well, that's what, I was, yeah. that's what I was trying to say that's earlier. There's so many people. There's so many people that contribute. It's hard to do anything. One thing that stands out in mind is that We've neglected the Ames family because we, this one got named all over Ames High School, and then after that, nothing came up uh, to okay. continue to name something. So I think that since this is the last major thing, and you know, library, the Oaks Ames Hall, Frothingham Hall, you know, I don't know, uh, the town offices, those were all donated to the town by the Ames family. Right. In other right. words, we should recognize what they've done. Right. The number of kids they've sent to college and all those other things. Mm -hmm. I mean, okay. scholarship. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I appreciate all of you coming to give your input. This is great. Please stay. We have much <laughs> more on the agenda. <laughs> oh, one second. I would just say that. One uh, second. So you do have, you have been talking about criteria. Yeah. And I think it is important to get that down on paper. Uh -huh. To explain to people uh, what lens <laughs> For example, you've talked about 
making sure that you are not, that if, it, if it is a, if it is a person you are memorializing someone, someone who is still out there, yeah. right. someone who's still out but that is a criteria. So I think it's important to put those things down because you may have to say you don't have to let the Okay. I also know that you've got information so you should be that but it's also that Excuse me. Hold on. Thank you. Okay, go ahead, Dr. Cabral. You can leave, just go quietly. <laughs> you should also do that research because you have gotten five minutes, not because people couldn't say more, but because you put a limit on right. them. So in all fairness, you really need to thoroughly get any names that would be right. too long. So okay. that's your presentation. Thank you. I think you should recess for like a minute. Yeah, we'll we'll hold on this discussion till. Thank you, everybody. That you're going. thanks for coming. Yeah, we'll just talk in a minute. Yeah. Uh, we're just gonna recess for. Uh, I make a motion to recess for three minutes. Second. All those in favor, okay. <laughs> criteria on paper with research make sure we vet all these names and come to an agreement about how we're going to name the school with what we've been given as nominations correct? So, uh, my suggestion is because we don't have uh, our next meeting is at uh, it's a morning meeting and I'm guessing we have that be able to answer right so I want to make we should all be at uh, Right. So the and March wanna, meeting. If we want to wait that long, oh. or if we want to do make a new meeting, we could just do a workshop one afternoon if we're all available, yeah. just to kind of focus on this and get sure. this, you know. All right. We'll look at schedules, and uh, I'll talk to Lynn, and uh, we'll figure it out. Okay, great. Okay, that's a great idea. Thank you. Does anyone else want to add anything to this discussion right at the moment? Okay. So I'm going to make a motion to put number eight, discussion and possible vote of on name for new elementary school to the next meeting. Or the next meeting that we have about this. To a meeting that we have to be scheduled. Thank you girls. What did I do? <laughs> oh my goodness. So do I have a second? Second. All those in favor. Okay, thanks. Okay. <coughs> Sorry. All right, we're going to jump back to number six. Vote to accept accept anonymous donation for OA scholarship. Dr. Cabral. Okay. <coughs> so uh, I just want to point out that the director of guidance, guidance Susan Mancuso, was here for quite a long time. I did tell her that she could leave because we ran out of time before the 7.30 posted time to have the last conversation. Mm -hmm. So she was here to answer any questions, but I, I believe we have been filled in sufficiently on the information. Uh, if you do have further questions, I can easily contact her and get that for you. But I have um, sort of a, a mixed mixed, announce, mixed message announcement for you this evening. Um, and that is, I want to start with some really just amazing news. And that is that we have been notified that a former resident who wishes to remain anonymous is interested 
in making a tremendous donation in the form of scholarships to Oliver Ames students. Uh, they would like to donate, uh, or, or th they would like to uh, put into a fund a total of a million dollars to provide a minimum of five, six thousand dollar scholarships per year to Oliver Ames graduates. So just process that for a moment because I, I don't even have the words for how <laughs> generous that is. And when we talk about paying something forward, it's just completely amazing and outstanding. And I completely understand the individual's um, desire to remain anonymous, and certainly we will honor that. But I truly wish we could honor this person publicly, and I, and I hope they know just how grateful we are. Um, I will say that we hit a bit of a legal snag with it, and so uh, that's the part that I'd like to fill you in on. Uh, there were five designations that the donor, who certainly can designate anything they wish, um, wished to make. And those designations are one scholarship awarded to a senior who is active in athletics, one scholarship to a senior who is active in extracurricular endeavors other than athletics, a senior, the third is a senior who succeeds despite a significant challenge, such as physical or medical limitation. The fourth is for a female senior who plans a career in secretarial or administrative work. And the fifth, uh, a, scho <coughs> excuse me, a scholarship to a, fe uh, a male senior who's planning a career in a trade or vocation that doesn't require a four-year college degree. <laughs> Now those qualifications are very clear. However, because we are a public school system, I am aware of laws. I did have our legal counsel really, as you can imagine, exhaustively investigate this. And according to Massachusetts Regulation 603 CMR 26.07, any contributions to a school for activities and monetary awards within or sponsored by the school or for scholarships administered by the school by any person, group, or organization shall be free from any restrictions <coughs> based upon race, color, sex, gender identity, religion, national origin, or sexual orientation. Two of the designations here specify a female or a male. And so it would be unlawful for us to provide that. Mm -hmm. We've had several conversations with the donor, and the donor, <coughs> understandably, the donor can, can choose whatever they wish, uh, is very adamant about keeping the wording exactly as it is. Um, I wish I could tell them that we could do this differently, but under the parameters of the law, according to our attorney, the school department can have no role in administering such a scholarship. We've tried to find some workarounds, because certainly we don't want, definitely don't want to seem ungrateful because we are not. Um, and we also, don't want to insult this very generous benefactor. So what I have, what I'm asking the uh, guidance director to do is talk to uh, the donor about potentially making this a private scholarship. As many of you are probably aware, you may be confused that I'm saying this because you may have heard about scholarships that are for someone specifically of Irish descent or a female who's pursuing a career in a certain area such as this um, denotes. That is possible, and we have had students that have received that. However, we did not administer the funds, and we did not have a role mm -hmm. in the uh, selection 
<coughs> the applicant, the, the, excuse me, the donor has asked that the school's scholarship committee be involved in the process. So while we certainly don't want to create any undue burden for the donor to, to relinquish that responsibility, we just, we simply are unable to do it. Um, I've had two different attorneys look into this and a third doing research for them. And it's, it's extremely clear mm -hmm. that we cannot be involved in administering, financially administering, or selecting, or organizing, or in any way being involved with a scholarship that is exclusive. Based on the, the, the subgroups I mentioned, one of which is um, gender. Mm -hmm. So the, where we are at right now, uh, <clears throat> while I wish we were asking for you to accept this very generous donation, we do need to make sure that the donor is comfortable with doing that. I will tell you that there have been a lot of back and forth conversations. Um, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to speak for the donor, but I can imagine at this point they are frustrated, mm -hmm. and I and I can't blame them for that. So there is a risk that we may not get the scholarship, uh, any of them. Um, I just need to let you be aware of that and to let you know why we are going to be sharing this information and asking if perhaps we can post it as a private scholarship and give them suggestions and recommendations about how other private scholarships have composed their selection committee and um, allocated their funds and so forth. Um, the donor did express a desire for it to be um, a fund that is administered by the town. I have an attorney working on it right now to see if the town has the, uh, the opportunity to do that within the boundaries of the law, but it's very clear that the, the school does not. Yeah. I kind of suspect the town would not any more than we would, but I know that you're having the director of guidance ask about um, the donor considering a private scholarship. Possibly another idea would be to ask if the donor, essentially as it's stated now, it's six scholarships, uh, I mean, five scholarships at six thousand dollars each. But you could—that's forty forty percent of the scholarships. Therefore, are for these two, unfortunately, unlawful for us to administer purposes. Um, would the donor consider simply donating the amount for the three scholarships that are not in question in terms of our administering them? And then, I mean, it is an overwhelming well, it can be an overwhelming task to set up a selection committee and do all those things, but you wouldn't have to do that for all five scholarships if you split it into a private scholarship for those two that the donor feels strongly about and then kept it as, you know, something that the school administered for the rest of them. In other words, do a 600,000, 400,000, something like that. Just an idea that maybe I will the donor would consider. Present that. It, is, it is my understanding that at this point the donor is has made it very clear what, what they're looking to do very generously. Um, they prepared a press release and, and without specifying particular reasons, <coughs> there are reasons for five specific scholarships and for those specific designations. And so I'm, I'm sure that it's my understanding they want to preserve it exactly that way. Mm -hmm. But we will absolutely bring that forward as a, as a suggestion, another another possibility. If anybody has any other ideas, I am open to forwarding that as well. That's up to you. Okay. Go ahead, Ms. Thomas. I have a question on scholarships. Um, does, who picks, when you want to give you a private scholarship, and I gave pri small private scholarships in my uh, mother's name, the school department wanted to pick the person getting it, and it seems to me they didn't necessarily give it to the one that I wanted to set up to, to give it to, to the type of thing that I, the categories like I wanted to establish. So after about 10 years, I stopped giving it. Um, does the school department pick the people that get these scholarships when you contribute money in a scholarship? No, it's up to the donor. If it, Some donors tell the us donor, they want the school to pick. Yeah. Some give a very specific criteria like number one in the class and there's really no, no other determination and some completely choose on their own. 
but if, if it goes into the general Easton scholarships, the the guidance, I believe the guidance department is basically there's in There's a that. scholarship committee. Yeah, there's a committee. But the donor determines if they want the scholarship de committee to choose the student or not. Right, it depends. You know, so you can they, still pick, if you give a scholarship, you can still pick your, uh, pick the person that's going to go. If you're, the, if you're the one making the donation, then you get the letters that the kids write, and you go through them, and you choose the person. Okay? All right. Thank you. All right, so at this time, then, we are going to... Any, any other ideas? Oh. <laughs> yeah. Better Unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. Talk to the little bit, yeah. I hope I hope it I works do want out. to say, you know, just how very thankful oh. we are to even be have our students thought of in yeah. this way mm -hmm. and make so much to consider to it is doing amazing. something this generous. And we're mm -hmm. we're very appreciative and very regretful that this has caused right. you know uh, complications for the donor that we certainly didn't intend and don't right. want <laughs> to happen. But <coughs> so any more discussion? All right. So at this point and make a motion to table number six until we get more information. Correct? <laughs> Do I have a second? Second. All right, all those in favor. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. <clears throat> number 10, discussion on updates to adopted policies. Okay, so we continue to do research on this because uh, we, as you're all aware, we've recently followed the recommendation that we put forward to put the <coughs> committee policy manual, even though it is in progress of being updated, on the website so that it's very easy for people to reference. So that has been done. In that process, Lynn particularly has found a lot of <coughs> items that are easily updated, that don't need deliberation mm -hmm. and so forth. So for example, if you take a look at number 10. <coughs> number 10 is actually <coughs> not necessary for you to vote on. If I'm out next to you, I don't need to know from the doctor. Everybody knows why I'm not going to be in next week. We're all in our bubbles. <laughs> In number 10, we noticed that the vision, theory of action, and core values is, does not reflect the new ones that you voted on. Also, there's an area that says to contact Michael Green, which clearly is outdated. Mm -hmm. Those kinds of things, and I, I actually got this determination from the attorney back after this was posted, so I just left it here as a, a perfect example of what the attorney says, we can just make those corrections on your behalf. Okay. Okay. Because there is not a deliberation about that. I don't think we're going to debate whether that we do have a new vision or values mm -hmm. or that Dr. Green is not the superintendent anymore. So things like that, we will go through and make those okay. um, changes. So you don't need to do any kind of vote on things like that. I just want to make sure you're aware of that. Mm -hmm. okay. However, number 11 is a vote to approve the changes to an updated policy which we received uh, from the attorneys and you've reviewed already and this is the educational opportunities for military children mm -hmm. so these have been these are reflective of new laws and requirements that were vetted through mass association of school committees and also our attorneys and so this is an example of one that you do need to vote on because it is of substance so this would be policy JFABE, opportun Educational Opportunities for Military Children. Does anybody have any um, comments or corrections or additions, deletions? I was a military child. <laughs> and so you they didn't have any policy. of these policies then, and I feel she did. that wasn't. I'm going to wave my magic she... wand. We could go back to Texas and be in the fine. military. Uh, I went to 13 schools. Wow. Oh my gosh. No well, schools. not all of them were in the United States. There you go. Okay. So, anybody have any comments on J F A B E? No. That looks reasonable. 
Hmm? It all looks I mean, we've, we've looked at yeah. this before. So. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, do we have a motion to approve changes to policy file JFABE as highlighted in our packet? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Thank you. And there's more coming down the pike. Yes, there are. Yes, there are. Did everybody get the mailing? Did everybody get the what? The mailing? Yes. 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 Okay. Um, next up is vote to approve the school committee's annual report to the town. So that you should have one. Before <clears throat> Caroline says anything, I just want to say <laughs> mm -hmm. that I have this draft. I received it today, and I am going to. I've already promised. Nancy, that I will go through and make any edits that are of substance <coughs> in terms of grammatical issues. So, not that there are grammatical issues. Oh, but there could be. Sure. <laughs> I, I was a math sure teacher. You know that we already talked about that. So, <laughs> so um, do we want to wait until? Well, what's the? I, when does it do? It's due tomorrow. Oh, okay. I, I have a minute to read through this because I yep. I know you said. I sent it. I, I saw the draft yesterday. And then I sent the other one. Yeah, and I haven't yeah. had the chance okay. to read this. That's fine. It doesn't take that long, really. I, mean, I only changed a couple things today, so. Okay. <clears throat> but I left it till the last minute, and I should have. Oh, I see that too. But I'm, like I was telling Leisha Caroline, I'm bad with like capital letters, you know, all the punctuation stuff. I'm really bad with it, so. But these annual reports, and mm -hmm. having done six in the past, mm -hmm. they're a bear. I mean, they're yeah. a lot to a lot, a lot of information. Yeah. And we have actually changed how we've done this. <laughs> and it's been confusing for people, understandably, because it's been done for a very long time. And that is that the town creates a book for a calendar year. Right? That was always problematic for us mm -hmm. because we, our report is the longest we have participation from every department, every school, school committee, uh, myself, professional development, special education, and it is always hard to think of what we do in a school year. And particularly when we're talking about things like budgets or academic achievement or new initiatives that are taking place, they usually take place by school year. They don't take place by calendar year. And so last year, uh, I approached the town manager who was uh, very kind to, to listen to the pitch to ask if we could just do it a little bit differently. And instead of doing the calendar year of 2019 from January to December, incorporate most of the calendar year by starting in September 2018 until through August of 2019. That we were only three to four months off, Makes every month else. Sense. And it's an actual school year. Mm. So last year we did that, and I, I, I have to say, it is preserved for posterity, so anybody can see it on their own. Last year we had sort of a back and forth <laughs> because we, there were things that were submitted and we, and we did a lot of work and it was, People were going back and forth between the academic year and the school year. So there are some things in there that are repeated this year. And I said, there may be one year of some overlap, and that's perfectly fine. There has to be, right? Mm -hmm. There has to be that year of overlap. Mm -hmm. So this year, we are focusing on the 18-19 school year for the 2019 town report. And um, so unfortunately, some people had to go back and do some revisions, and then we put it all together and make sure it flows and is edited and so forth so that has that set a couple of people back mm -hmm. uh, because even though you know they were reminded Linda did a great reminder to everybody but old habits die hard and they've done it that way for such a long time um, we did have to go back and, and make some significant changes so we'll be sending it to the town um, actually on Saturday are they making changes to this now no, this is the school committee. This is, yes. this is right. a part of the town report. This is this is sent 
along with it. This is part of, so this is separate from the, and is this the school year or the, also? This is the, the school year, F right. 18 it, to 19. Okay. For the most part. So, so yeah. just to point yeah. out the, that this, the, the paragraph on school, <coughs> well, just to point out the paragraph on STEAM, Actually, it's so, yeah. the 1920 school year. Right. Yeah, so you might want to save that. That's 1920. Would you say that again? Which the, one? It starts at the bottom of page two. Oh, and yeah. it's that last paragraph up to the, the so, top of page three. That was the, so I just found out about the 2018-19. I wrote this as 2019 to begin with. Okay. Right, because it covers your trip to China, which right. was, was all. Yes. Yeah. So then I have nothing left to write about because all that's going to take. <laughs> well, no, no. Do you have? I mean, that's like the vote was in November, October, and November. So the vote would be out too. Yeah. But I think that's a very important thing in yeah. 2019. Well, in 2000, and, and it will go in the 1920 school year. I get that. But, but in 2018-19, we certainly were well into the process. And the oh yeah, I so mean, you certainly can write about the school project. There's no question about that. Mm. We had already had a school planning committee. No, no. And that actually was in the 2018. There was a great right. paragraph right. in there because about the going school. To be that overlap and how. Because it went through to December. Okay. And now we're going back from September to. And I'll, I'll just use myself as an example. You will see in my report that there is overlap from last year's report. Okay. And that is because of the transition. Mm -hmm. And I think so, that I this mean, is the year that we see what Alicia had yeah. talked about. Right. And, and so next year, and whoever is chair, I would very much help put this, you know, with the school. Like right now, that's what we should be doing, or somebody, I could do it, is just keeping track of, what did you say, September 1st or August 1st? What September until the end of August. August, so keeping track right now so that that could just be, even if it's repeated again next year, I don't think it's going to hurt. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, you asked me yeah. earlier how many people read the report besides the I think a lot of people read the report. Three or four. No, I think a lot. <laughs> I mean, besides all. So, the all right. So, 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 right now, your report is based on the full 2019 year. I believe so. Okay. So. And I guess part of 2018 from some of the awards and things right. like that. So. I mean, it doesn't. It doesn't seem reasonable that Nancy can. We write right. this all by tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, can we just leave it like this? And like I said, now we now we know that it's going to be ch next year's report is September first, two thousand nineteen, to August thirtieth, two thousand twenty, and some of the stuff will be repeated. Be repeated. Yeah. I don't know. I can, I, mean, I can fix it. I, well, yeah, I, I just. It, it just seems I, I totally get that I totally understand like what why we would do on the academic year but given the timing of this it's it's six months out of date by the time we're writing it we've missed well, the last six months of activity and you if don't we, receive it, you don't yeah. receive the annual report until town meeting right, right. yeah so that point it's almost a year out of date versus if we kind of so went through and the when I, if, year. if I go to the 2019 town report, and I go to the Eastern School Committee, I think I want to know that in 2019, we, we, we just got approved by million. the MSBA to spend all that money on a new school. Like, I don't see waiting another year to put that in. Let's put it in again with a name. Next year, we can put it in with a name. <laughs> I, think, I don't think there's any harm in having things from the engineer yeah. in the school committee chair person's report. Yeah. I don't think there's any harm in that. It was always the calendar year and it was always It still is. The town is still doing no, I know the town is. I'm just saying it was always a, a challenge because yeah. there was that, you know, because, and well, plus you're writing the report at the end of January and right. it seemed like every time I wrote a report everything happened in January. Right. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute, I can't put that in. Oh, wait a minute. You know, so it was, it was confusing. But I think it would look crazy not to include the, the new school right. books. Yeah. I mean, that's so significant. I just had a small recommendation for that, though. Authorize a debt exclusion override to provide um, funding for the new school. Second paragraph, instead of to build the new school, only because it's essentially the override. Yeah. Right. So again, to provide funding. For the new to provide school. funding. Okay. I mean, technically, we had to remember we right. had to vote no. for the whole thing, but then we right. got the state grant. But that just yep. you know. 
No, thank you. That's why I need your eyes, Carolyn. Mm -hmm. But I haven't, I haven't also gone over this. But, but I think it's fine, and I don't think there's any problem well, with there being. Nobody is going to call up and say, "Wait a minute, this happened out after." Right. Right. Uh, you know, I, it's just not. And then happen. now going forward, <coughs> now next year it'll be 2019-2020. Yeah. You know, well, the school department is doing 2018-19. You can still do 2019 if you want to for your school committee. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's I, yeah. I just think at this point, it's that's not realistic to redo it. Yeah, and, okay. well, and I think it has all the important it, information. There's enough it context it. to understand that some of it refers to the previous academic year, and some of it refers to, you know, yeah. calendar year. And, yeah, I I don't I wasn't granted. We live and breathe this, so we're not really the audience. But I had no trouble kind of following mm -hmm. okay. when stuff happens. So I don't think a reader will have. So, to do we want to make a motion to accept this? And if Dr. Cabral finds things that could be corrected, not of substance. I'm not, not going to change anything. Mm -hmm. My capital letters and That's stuff like that. Um, can we make a motion to accept it yes. as is with? Possible corrections. I will make a motion to accept the 2019 annual report of the Eastern School Committee with possible corrections by Dr. Cabral. Second. All those in favor. And the other thing I was going to say, girls, if you find something tonight, tomorrow, I mean, you know, shot it in and I'll tell you. Oh, good yeah. job on They can just contact me directly. Okay. A lot Fine. of stuff in there, so. Yeah. All right. Public comment. We're going to start up back. One second, Jane. We're going to start up back. Okay, I probably missed my opportunity when we were talking about the schools, but I've been dwelling on this the whole time. Can I just, I work at Parkview, and we have been generously offered many opportunities throughout this entire process, come to the meetings, have an interior meeting, have meetings you know, with all your ideas on the interior, the exterior, everything you want to know, but now when it comes time to making this important decision for the naming, while it's been awesome listening to all these choices, now I find out that it's nothing against you guys, but it's just up to you five. And it just seems like this would be a great opportunity for the teachers, could we weigh in on this? Like we're the ones who are gonna be working and walking into the building every day. Like there's so many amazing choices. I just feel like to be told that we were going to be part of the process and to not have any part of the meaning just doesn't feel 100% right. And I know there's a lot of people involved, but maybe just some way. Like, just consider it. Okay. Um, maybe when we're um, looking at our criteria, and I don't, I don't know. Well, I, think, well, I, I think, think we can so still people. accept if, if somebody at, especially after hearing what was proposed tonight, if there are members of the community who want to send, you know, maybe send an email or, you know, um, put together something, you know, some feedback for us to consider because it'll be, you know, we'll have a separate meeting, so it'll be some time between now and when we vote on it. Maybe that could, you know, just to discuss it. Yeah. yeah. Just I, I personally got a lot of emails. For all day, not necessarily a name, but people's thoughts about how they felt about the school. So, so it's okay for me to yes. share that with mm -hmm. people if they ask me how it can come. Mm -hmm. They go ahead and write an email. Yeah, for you sure. Go to? And Deluca at Eastern dot K twelve dot Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Sorry. Why are you sorry? So I have a question. I'm going to rewind a little bit, and, and maybe I should have asked when Wes was here. Um, but this kind of, I think it relates to the program of studies, but I'm. So the presentation on the program of studies tonight was really incredible and really exciting. But one of the things, and I know that we're working on curriculum and making sure that our curriculum is written so kind of from a university of design perspective <coughs> so all students can access and learn. But I wonder in terms of the program of studies, what what 
methods or mechanisms, or how are we ensuring that all students, particularly our subgroups of students, um, have access to all of the um, opportunities that exist within our, our program of studies, particularly as that program of studies becomes more robust and more comprehensive and, and more thoughtful. Um, I know that a lot of the um, conversations and a lot of the literature now, particularly when you start looking at subgroups, it shows that there is a kind of inverse proportion <coughs> of cer certain populations of students that have mm -hmm. access to certain courses. And I wonder what we do to help mitigate <coughs> that. And it's not an easy problem, it's a, you know. Chrissy? Did you want to uh, I was just gonna, going to say that we do have data now um, that actually points out for the district uh, what populations are not taking the courses and what populations are taking the courses. And Wes does review that with his um, department heads as well as with the guidance department. Um, that is something, it's, it, and it is something that, that anyone can access. And so what are we doing with that data? that right so um, what I was going to say I always take the balcony view I know. <laughs> so I go back at the district level and I interestingly had this conversation just yesterday with some staff members and this is not it's not a quick fix you don't look at something and say oh that's off okay let's change that tomorrow uh, it, it's more of a, uh, a culture within a, a department. And so, not to belabor all the things that we've been working on, but I'm gonna connect it to what we were talking about, or what I brought up actually earlier with the social studies in, in history curriculum. There are really kind of a couple of ways to approach something. And what we've tried to do here at Easton is make sure that we aren't just looking at you can, you can jump out and check off some boxes and make some charts. Um, or you can take the less satisfactorily long way of going about it and starting with the foundation. So as an example, I recently attended a meeting of superintendents, which shall name, uh, remain unnamed. <laughs> A meeting of superintendents. So a lot of my colleagues around the district, and this is exactly what we were talking about. <coughs> and the presenters, who were wonderful and had a lot of great information to present, the quick version basically were giving us these spreadsheets in ways to capture all of the data that Chrissy's talking about. Um, because we have so much available to us. <coughs> Every subgroup how they're achieving, where they're achieving it, who their teachers are, how much experience their teachers have, what degrees their teachers have in relation to what they're teaching. We have all this information. And they wanted to help all of us put it into this ginormous spreadsheet of many, many, many pages, which has value, ultimately. It was a great visual, and they presented it very well, but I was, I didn't express great <laughs> enthusiasm about it. And the reason was because, <coughs> first and foremost, you show this packet to a bunch of educators, and, and what is that to them? It's another thing to do. In a, a, in a world where they have a million things to do, and I always say, everybody says it back to me, I say, you know what I'm going to say, what is the, and they always say purpose. What is the purpose of doing this? And that's exactly to the, your question, Jane. So we fill out this chart. What is the purpose? I don't feel that filling out the chart, well, it might check a box somewhere, really makes any substantive change. However, if you have an environment that we really Sparked, sorry, <laughs> with Easton, I believe, where we are 
talking about social justice and social injustice. We're talking about unconscious bias and conscious bias. We're talking about white privilege and white fragility. And we're really approaching these conversations, true equity, true access. And we are running book clubs, and we have professional guidance, and we have professional development, and we have conversations at staff meetings. And I saw evidence of this yesterday, which is why this is a timely question. Because these teachers were saying, I said, so, so you know, you, you read this book, and you did this work, what are some of the things that are coming from it? And they talked about the conversations it has and their curiosity. And they said, so I want to know, like, what is the achievement gap here? And where do we have the classes that aren't? And I went, ding, ding, ding. At that point, you can say, well, I have a tool for you. Do you see the difference? Mm -hmm. the, first, the way I'm describing it takes longer. However, anything that ha is going to stick, be meaningful, and last, and really make a significant change, has, you have to invest the time and resources in it for that to happen. And those sort of paradigm pedagogical shifts for people, they take time. And, it, and when they're, all they're doing all day long is planning and assessing and working with kids and, and giving their heart every day to this work. So this was a small group of teachers, but then it's going to be a larger group of teachers, and then it's going to be a larger group of teachers, and then I can start showing some data points we have and start showing the charts, and then we can start making some of these substantive changes. But if I were using that chart as an example to plop this up in, at the cabinet and say, <coughs> who needs to fill this out, and then look it over and analyze it, there isn't going to be that second part, which is the, the meat of your question. And what's, what's the result of that? So now, I literally have people asking for that. After a very short amount of time. Is that everybody and everywhere with every data point on that chart? No. But it was enough to show me that our initial efforts are starting to spread. And I, I, we can do the charts. And, and you know, we, if we're mandated by the state, we'll have to do the charts. Mm -hmm. but I really believe that this is the more purposeful and uh, meaningful way to go about that work. Does that make sense? Yeah. Talk about <coughs> value review, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, it, and it will take us time, but I am already very encouraged by the conversations, the openness, the humility, the reflection that has been taking place in our community, our staff, and our students. Um, and it will not be fixed overnight, but we do have some things that are taking off and are getting changed very quickly. But um, while people may not see it, I really want to assure you that this, this work is already um, creating some shifts in perspective. And a shift in perspective will change everything else. Mm -hmm. It really will. I just want to point out that that I feel like Dr. Capral's description right there is how change occurs. Mm -hmm. And so often we are dropped with emails of new data is coming out from the state. And you know that I feel like what, what I was just sharing is a result of the bombardment of emails that I received from the from Desi, you know, because they're trying to pr provide us with the information. Um, and and by bombarding us, so, you know that that small percentage is actually tied to accountability as well, of how many students are accessing um, uh, advanced right. courses, coursework, and so we're we're kind of do, do you see the the dilemma that we are in education is that we're hit with these accountability measures, and we're forced to do things quickly, without having the understanding and the knowledge that Dr. Cabral is describing, mm -hmm. and I feel like you know with with being able to take a step back and look from the balcony, like Dr. Cabral was describing, mm -hmm. that's when change will occur, and and it will and it will it will stick. With that said, when we are spark. keenly aware that every student has one grade three and one grade six and one grade eleven, mm -hmm. 
And so I don't want you to think we aren't instituting measures right away, and that we aren't looking at this, and we aren't discussing this as a leadership team, but those underpinnings um, where we're going to see the real momentum and change, um, I think that is going to take off as soon as, as soon as that's firmed up, it's, it's really going to take off. Mm -hmm. And I'll just add um, a view from kind of in the trenches. So I have um, one of my kids is going through course selection, right? Well, we'll be going through course selection, and I have to say, this is the this is the you know this is number three of four kids. This is the earliest I've heard any of my kids talk about courses for high school, and the most information that's come home. Um, so these conversations are happening. They're happening in every classroom. They're happening with every teacher. He's getting really valuable perspectives and insights and. Um, you know, not to share too much about, you know, my kid on cable, but this is not <laughs> Facebook Live. No, right, yeah. But, you know, not not somebody who is, you know, the, the most together, you know, necessarily. Like, but kind of, it's really been like a blue sky experience where, um, you know, he's, there's been suggestions made for him for, the, or he's thrown out and said, you know, well, what would it take for me to get there? And he's not being shut down. You know, it's it seems much more, like m much more of a, of a blue sky type of thing, and a kind of, and I, and I think you know this. This is is, is helping already. Is that yeah. I yes. think it's just it is, it's yes. just posted, right? Um, but yeah, you know what I mean. So kind of, he's kind of look because he sort of knows what he wants to maybe maybe do career wise, and 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 I don't know if this was literally shown to him, but he was thinking, oh, well, I got to squeeze in. I want to try to get this class in junior year and this class in senior year. And, and it was just like it was really, really encouraging to to hear. And and even in in you know my eighth grader, they were already starting to talk about you know their their course comes later. And this <coughs> certainly not as much available as to a ninth grader. You know this is really you don't get to select a lot, but they are they're talking about it down in eighth grade too. So it's there. It's, it's kind of good to to hear it. You know, and 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 just not even just my child, but just. You know, I was we were at a hockey game, and it, it, conversations. Yeah, the conversations are happening. So, so yeah, so it's, it's getting it's getting from school to home, which is good. That's it. Okay. Uh, superintendent notes. None tonight. And assistant superintendent notes. You don't <laughs> pass on. Come on. Uh, I just wanted to share that I had the privilege of attending the Massachusetts Interscholastic Athletic Association. 2020 Girls and Women in Sports Day at Faneuil Hall mm -hmm. uh, last Friday, and our very own Lainey Clement Holbrook addressed the students and audience as the keynote speaker. Uh, she delivered a wonderful message about success and determination for all girls in sports. Lainey went on to win her 700th career win that night mm -hmm. as our um, varsity girls basketball team head coach. Awesome. So it just was a it was a great day, and just an honor and privilege to be there. Um, to see that occur. Um, I also want to share that I had the honor of being a judge at the fourth annual Poetry Out Loud contest. Uh, there were 10 contestants. Each contestant had to memorize and share two poems, and they were judged on delivery, interpretation, and overall presentation. Um, Aiden Marcus was this year's winner, and will be heading to the state semifinals in Hopkinton on February 29th at 10 o'clock in the morning. So good luck to Aiden. And she was, she was fantastic. Department. The English department teachers, yeah, who volunteer their time and really um, work very hard with the students, not only in preparation, but they're there that evening, right? Mm -hmm. and, and really have, a, by at this point, a well-oiled machine in, mm -hmm. in how they, they get it done, because it's very fast paced. Yeah. So um, I really want to make sure they get a shout out. They're, they're great. And then just a reminder that our, our fourth workshop of our equity series will be coming on March 4th. Uh, the focus of this session will be to explore the importance of social skills in all areas of academics and life. We'll examine the skills required to be an effective school communicator while taking a closer look at the profile of individuals who struggle socially. The session will address effective strategies to incorporate in both the educational and home setting to support learners with social weaknesses to be successful in both school and life. And that is from four o'clock to six o'clock the, in the PD room at Richardson Olmstead uh, um, for staff members. Oh, okay. And for 6.30 to 8.30 
for our community mm -hmm. um, in the ROPD room as well. I thought it was in the captain. No, it's in, okay. it's in the professional club. Okay. Yeah. Second floor, right across from the Yes. Floor. And registration is preferred but not required. That it? That's it. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Uh, school committee notes. Go ahead, Carolyn. I, <laughs> okay, I, I actually do have a few tonight. I don't think I have any I don't think you did. Well, first of all, I'm sure Michelle will elaborate on this, but, well, really all of us uh, were at the Tempo Dessert Show, which was fabulous. And I'm sure Michelle will talk more about that. Last night, not last night, let's see. Yes, I go. My <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. Just passing the... Yeah. <laughs> Uh, no, I meant. <coughs> sorry. Uh, last night was the <coughs> school planning committee's meeting with the abutters, and I just wanted to compliment the team, the Perkins Eastman and the was, um, PMA. PMA, right? Um, they just did a wonderful job, very patiently, very conscientiously addressing every concern that was raised and Dr. Peral also played an important role in, in kind of really just listening and reassuring people. Uh, I think that a few people did arrive clearly quite agitated. I, there were about 12 of others mm -hmm. that attended. Um, and I just, I didn't feel that agitation at all when the meeting ended. There will be other meetings, but this was, I mean, I was, it was really quite remarkable how well and patiently all of the concerns of the others were addressed because it, I know we all are thrilled with this wonderful new elementary school that's going to rise up for our children, but you know, obviously it will have an impact on some people that live right in the neighborhood. Um, and uh, one of the things that we did talk about which was very interesting, I don't know if anybody saw the article in the world about the uh, group of families in Needham, I believe, mm -hmm. that is uh, after the <coughs> project like this, they developed cracks all over their houses, and all the walls, the floors, everything. But because they didn't have a video of their homes and the interiors before the construction, both insurance companies involved are refusing, not surprising that much when it comes to insurance companies, with technicalities, they're not paying for any of the repairs, which, you know, if you, if you read about it, clearly were caused by this heavy machinery mm -hmm. that caused the whole earth to shake for blocks. So this, they proactively, one of the, Dan Colley, Colley, mentioned how important he thought it would be for us to include that in the specs that we would do, this is, you know, these um, surveys of the homes first. Mm -hmm. And then I actually mentioned that, you know, the most, to me, important in butters are all of the children that are going to be in the other schools. So I think we need to do this for our schools too because you know the construction company will be responsible if they if their equipment causes this damage, but you have to be able to demonstrate mm -hmm. very clearly mm -hmm. that, that that's the case. <clears throat> I know I'm going on a bit, but I thought you folks would find this mm -hmm. interesting because it's kind of a something that a lot of people don't think about. And we're very appreciative that the, the neighbors came and we encourage them to keep coming because there are considerations that obviously, if you don't live right there, you wouldn't know. It doesn't right. matter how many times you go up and down the street, mm -hmm. you need to live it to understand it. Mm -hmm. And so we need that lens. And so we appreciate everything that they um, contributed to the conversation, suggestions, recommendations, concerns, and um, are using them to create solutions that couldn't have been created. <coughs> so we are very, very thankful for their time. The last thing I'm going to mention is, is not necessarily specifically related to the schools, but it certainly involves children. Um, on Tuesday night, I went to the uh, presentation by Moms Demand Action, <clears throat> which is a, a gun safety advocacy group. And as they repeated several times, they're not <coughs> a high gun, but they are definitely strong proponents of safe measures mm -hmm. to protect children. And there were some kind of shocking statistics. I hope you'll bear with me because I do think this is super important. Um, one in three homes, well, first of all, the number, <coughs> the number of gun deaths of children in the country is increasing each year. I mean, it's tragic. 
They don't call them accidental shootings. They call them unintentional <coughs> shootings. And I thought this was a very good point because they're not accidents because they are, in most cases, fully preventable. They're not talking about suicide or homicide. They're talking about unintentional shootings where that two-year-old finds a loaded gun, shoots a civil, you know, this type of thing. And it's these kinds of things are increasing because one in three homes with children in the country have, uh, have guns. And of those, two out of three of those guns are not stored properly. Mm -hmm. So they're accessible to children. And, you know, that's just to think that two thirds of gun owners are not, that with children, are not properly storing those guns, which I found just incredible. And um, so they're, they're advocating actions like, probably most important, storing ammunition separately from the gun, certainly locking up the guns. Um, and, and they pointed out, I mean, there's some very good ways of sort of conceptualizing things. Hiding a gun is not securing the gun. Mm -hmm. A lot of people say, well, I hid it. I hid it in the closet. Because they're <coughs> able to demonstrate that most children absolutely know where the guns in the house are. Most parents don't think they know where the guns are. So there's this gap, which is what is creating really tragic situations. One quote that I wrote, it is always a re an adult's responsibility to prevent unauthorized access to guns, not a curious child's responsibility to avoid guns. Mm -hmm. They talked about the very simplistic gun safety NRA film, the, the materials that are provided for kids, and they were like, if you see a gun, just don't touch it. You know, it's like, you're going to tell a four-year-old, don't touch a gun? And they've shown videos of experiments where they've done, where they've given this little NRA video to kids and then they provided them, you know, obviously with an, um, a gun that won't shoot and things like that, but they go in a room and they find the guns right away, they're hidden, and they, of course, mm -hmm. pull the triggers because this is what kids do. So, um, <coughs> so the last thing I wanted to mention is I believe, please correct me if I'm wrong, that you said that we're not doing drills for kids anymore, correct? We've never done them. But I didn't think so. And good, because one of the things they really emphasize is that, yes, it's important to provide training for adults in the school, but they're finding this incredible escalation of anxiety, depression, all sorts of disorders in school districts where they do lockdown drills for kids. And in some districts, they don't even warn the kids. And they have real live, uh, I mean, they have this tragic sort of description of some of the kids' reactions, one little girl writing, tell my mom I love her, you know, things like that, because they, they thought these were real, and they were absolutely terrified. Carol, so, but, no, no, we, I, when you said the drills, I thought you meant the ones that we do with the adults. So we have lockdowns. Yes, for yes. adults. For, no, students. For students. Yes. Well, but they're announced. But not the ones that we have, which are far more aggressive. With okay, the, but they are, the students are told in advance, right? I mean, if, if not, then I would strongly encourage you to get this no, information. No, I'm pretty sure, because I've been there when that happened, mm -hmm. and there's there's a been an announcement. Right, and and they state that it's a, that it's a drill. That yeah. it's not, you know, it's a yeah. practice. Okay, do you state the purpose of the, I mean, do you state that it is specifically for a potential? No, act? I think okay. it's a shelter, it's, it's, it's a, shelter. Is a shelter in place. Yeah, there are two. Okay. A shelter in place is when you, the students are in the classroom, but you, the teacher does not let them go to the restroom or to the office. That's used for a lot of different scenarios, like there could be a medical emergency in the hallway and we need to have privacy for that person. But it's business as usual, but nobody leaves the classroom. That's all shelter in place means. And a lockdown is when the, the students move to a non-visible part of the room. So when I was, so last year I was at RO when this happened. So they had a fire drill. Everyone went out to the fire drill, came back in the classroom, and they all knew that once they got back in the classroom, they were going to have a lockdown drill. And all it really meant for the classroom was the teacher shut the door, and the kids went to the back of the classroom and sat on the floor and were quiet. And but what was the explanation that we're giving? There was no, it was just part of their drills. Just like they don't give an explanation, they didn't give an explanation for the fire drill. It just, they just did the fire drill, they came back, they did the lockdown drill. They didn't, they didn't say anything like, this is in case, blah, 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 blah. They just said, 
we're going to have a fire drill and then we're going to have a lockdown drill and that's is it. Well, I do think it's important for us to kind of do as much research as possible about how to handle these things and so on. I'm assuming we're, we've got top. I know we have a street that <coughs> us and one of the things, I mean, as you know, this has been one of my issues. They definitely do not advocate the Alice training. I mean, they were right. strongly opposed to that. But also, they have, there's a report that exists. I'll have to try to get the information out of that. But it talks about, um, it was developed by uh, medical experts along with the American Federation of Teachers and the NEA. And it's about children's reactions and how to handle like responses and so on that children may have to any of these things that occur that we're doing. Obviously, we're trying to keep children safe, but we also have to be cognizant of the, any kind of <coughs> potential reaction that kids mm -hmm. may have. We're and, well aware yeah. of that, and unfortunately, there are some <coughs> protocols. I explained one in the past that happened at my son's school, which are completely inappropriate, and um, I'm confident that's what they're referring to. There are some scare tactics. There are, um, whether they're intentional or not intentional, and we do not endorse them, and we do not do that with our students. Well, I didn't think so, and I thought that you had a nice notice on that before, but then when you, you know, it's the term lockdown that kind of triggers that. But it, there also but, was, like, nobody was going around checking doors and banging on doors and stuff no, like that. It was that's not, not no. there was none of that. We, when I talked about when I said no at first, it's because I thought you were referring to the training that we've done with the staff, so, which we were involved right. We yeah. are involved in barricades and things right. like that. We don't right. do that with students. No. We've never done that with students. No, we, you let us be involved in those trainings, and those were good. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, um, well, what and somebody may go around and, and check doors because they're checking to see if they're locked. Well, well that does, we don't do it in a way to fight children. Mm -hmm. And looking through the windows to make sure that they can't mm -hmm. see. Um, because then that's feedback for the teacher to make sure that they're mm -hmm. in this particular area. If the child's sitting there, they might be able to see. Well, I know this is the first thing we did, but they did say that the most important safety feature was doors that lock. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was, I mean, we did that right. some years ago, but that was the very first thing we kind of tackled. So the last thing was about <coughs> encouraging parents, more than encouraging, really just ensuring that parents, I knew we worked with the class. Sorry. Um, ask when they, when they, when their child is invited over to another child's house, how important it is to ask, do you have do you have guns in your house, and if so, how are they secured? Yeah. They said a lot of people are too embarrassed mm -hmm. to ask, they're uncomfortable. They said you can make it part of a, you know, I'm just a mom, I'm very concerned about a lot of safety issues. Do you store your alcohol? Do you, you know, just kind of go mm -hmm. down the list and then. But, you know, they said, bottom line is, being a polite parent is a lot less important than just saying, I'm sorry, my child, I'm not comfortable having my child mm -hmm. come and play there. You know, and, and you can say things like, my, my child is, is really curious, and I'm not sure that they would necessarily, you know, mm -hmm. respond appropriately if they right. found an unsecured gun in the house. So, it's, uh, there's a whole little, I thought I had enough for everybody, but this is a whole thing about how you handle those situations, because it is awkward, right. but it's also really important when you think that that many households with children have guns in them, and two thirds of them are not secure. That's crazy. Yeah. So. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Over. Thank you, Thank you. Michelle. That presentation was two hours. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle. Um, well, I guess I will elaborate on the dessert show. We had a guest server for the night. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It was my son, but she jumped in and rolled up her sleeves and got to work serving desserts <laughs> to people who were very into it and grateful. It was fun. It was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. the, the, the fun thing about that night is to see the progression mm -hmm. that the students go through. And as a senior mom, I made it that much more. Mm -hmm. Like, oh. mm -hmm. um, from when they first start and then, oh yeah, they, they get to the EMS sixth grade band and the seventh grade band, the eighth grade band. And just how much better they get, more comfortable and more confident, mm -hmm. and um, you know, start to take risks and maybe do solos. And it, it's just really nice to see. And you see the same kids that have gone through the program, mm -hmm. and that kind of family bond. It was it's just it's a nice night to see all the 
ensembles mm -hmm. and how the image feeds into show choir and the, the jazz bands and the guitar ensemble. I think they've been only a couple years now. I think it's great for the students to see yeah. each other as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Gives them some like that. Mm -hmm. so Michelle's son, Sean, had mm -hmm. solo. Mm -hmm. yes. Yes. And yes. In the very last, and excellent. I thank yes. you people mm -hmm. who are kind enough to stay. And the robotics had their annual fundraiser, comedy fundraiser, um, this past weekend, which was a huge success, mm -hmm. and um, that's always a fun night. Great. Thank you. No, I'm not uh, <laughs> just a couple things that um, I was able to attend both of the equity series nights. So thanks for uh, you know, bringing those to the district. They were really enlightening, and I hope that everybody who attended um, got as much out of them as I did. So they were really great. Um, the CPAC had a, a, a daytime um, meeting earlier this week that I wasn't able to attend, but their next two uh, workshops will be evenings. Um, so, if anybody's interested, look uh, on the CPAC uh, Facebook page um, or the brochure. Um, you can find the information on the next upcoming meetings. And uh, I believe one of them will be at the Y, and there will be child care available for that. Um, and they've been doing um, a lot of, there's, there's been uh, quite a bit of work with some of the other local collaboratives um, on uh, detailed transition planning, and I know that we have several parents in the district who have been um, involved with going to some of the transition planning meetings for the soon-to-be graduates or young adults. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to congratulate the girls swim team undefeated this season and they won, I believe, the Hockamock champs mm -hmm. and I think came in third in the state so I think their season's wrapped up um, and I, I think the rest of the winter sports seasons are still going so good luck to all the rest of the winter sports teams. That was, sorry. And I just have one question, I think, Chrissy. So I think we talked about this before, but I just want to be reminded. Civics that we yes. talked about tonight, is that this year? <laughs> they're not doing an MCAS test this no, year. they are not. Next year? We're unsure. Okay. All right. Because I knew that was... They'll let us know two weeks before. Right. <laughs> I know. It's <laughs> thrown out. And then they'll call it a pilot. And, <laughs> I just have a couple of little things. Congratulations to Lady Holbrook. Awesome. Yes. Also, um, we have students over in Australia right now, so yes. I'm hoping New that they... New Zealand. New Zealand. They were in Australia, now they're in New Zealand. So I hope they have a great and safe trip and productive, and I'm really looking forward to hoping that they come to one of our meetings and tell us about it. Okay, does anybody have anything else? Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All those in favor. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all. For